Xbox On. Welcome to Xbox On, a podcast with one host about one console, Xbox. I'm said host, Jesse DeRosa, and on today's episode, we'll be talking about the latest Xbox news for the week of March 7th, 2024, including... Xbox just held a partner preview event, so let's discuss all the games that were shown during the presentation. Also, the newly acquired Activision team, Toys for Bob, is officially going independent. Saber Interactive and Gearbox Software could soon be free from the clutches of Embracer Group, and much more. On this day in Xbox history, in the year 2017, seven years ago, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Wildlands was released for the Xbox One in the US. Ghost Recon Wildlands. This game is still, like, I th- I have this game saved in my library as one of these games that, like, I'm determined to one day force myself to like. Like, when this game first came out, I didn't play it. I'd never played a Ghost Recon game at the time. And then a few years after it came out, probably around... It was around the time I moved to Florida, so probably 2019, about two years after the game came out, I remember buying the game on like one of those Ubisoft fire sales. Like, here, take our game for $13. We'll pay you to buy our game, you know, that kind of thing. I, I remember buying it for one of those dirt cheap prices, so, you know, if I didn't like it, I wouldn't feel bad. And trying to sit down with this game and being like, this game looks so cool. I love Far Cry. I feel like this is taking Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon and trying to Far cry fy it. Like, I'm going to like this game, right? And then, like, The first 30, 45 minutes of the game, I was like, yeah, I I think I like this game. And then the game just fell apart for me. I'm like, I don't really understand. Like, I feel like the game's like kind of guided and then just lets you loose. And I don't really understand how it wants me to play. And I'm not like really into the game. And then I remember deleting it, moving on with my life, coming back a few years later and being like, I'm going to give this game another try because the new Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon game was the what was the one that came out after this breakpoint. I, you know, it just looked like a direct sequel to this. I remember being like. This game looks so awesome. You know what? I'm going to go back to Wildlands, give it another try. I'm sure I'll like it this time. Same exact thing. Like an hour, two hours with the game. I'm like, no, this isn't it. And I I remember I tried it last year. Last year was the third time I've tried Ghost Recon Wildland because Breakpoint was on sale for like $8 or something. I was like, man, I really want to play Breakpoint, but if I don't even like Wildlands, why would I jump into Breakpoint? And for the third time, I could not get into this game, but... I'm still determined. I feel like every time I see this game or I'm reminded of this game's existence, I'm like, I th- it looks like a game I would like. You know, I like I like The Division. I like Far Cry. So there's a little Tom Clancy, a little Ubisoft love, a little open world, modern Ubisoft. Like, I feel like this game should be, you know, it's been focus tested and watered down. The, the identity of Ghost Recon has been watered down to the Ubisoft f- formula enough to the point where it's like, it should be inoffensive and, and, and palatable to all audiences but for, for some reason I just I just can't do it I don't know Ghost Recon what is wrong with you what why, what is wrong with me or what is wrong with you certainly there's nothing wrong with me so you must be the problem you wild wild land you anyway let's move on guys welcome to Xbox on Mike Clark writes in and says yes another week of Xbox on gonna be a great listen and we have to talk Mr. Cloud Gaming okay well that wasn't really like snarky or sarcastic so I don't you know what do I do with that sentiment it just seemed wholesome and 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 I don't know, maybe I read it wrong, but it just seemed like you were genuinely excited for the podcast. What am I supposed to do with that? Thank you, Mike Clark. Welcome, everyone, to episode 249 of the podcast. We got a nice levity this week because really there's not much to talk about in the way of, like, studio shut down, game developer died of drug overdose, although that's not really been a story. I'm just making that up. Uh, Layoffs, 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 layoffs. Everyone's sad. The economy's bad. Gas prices are not good. You know, like, we don't have to talk about that this week. It's it's actually quite a good week because Xbox, shortly after last week's podcast went live, was like, hey, tune in next week. We're going to have a little partner preview, Um, which... By the way, I, I, as a side note, I completely forgot they did one of these last year. Um, so I was like, oh, this is like the first time they're doing one of these. That will be fun. Uh, but I, I like how blatant both Xbox and PlayStation are at this point with just fully ripping off how Nintendo handles their their presentations and their, their, their messaging for like what's coming to their console at this point. 
Uh, I mean, Nintendo was just totally right. You go back to like 2010 or whenever they started doing Nintendo Directs and they were just so clearly ahead of the curve with that one. And then you fast forward to today. It's like, it's so nice to have like, okay, the, the, the big game showcase in the summer means that's when Xbox is going to show their, that's their big guns. That's their first party output. And then the, the partner previews are like, okay, these are like third party games that are coming to our platform that we have some kind of marketing or, you know, relationship with. And we want to showcase those and, and, and market it with our, with our platform in mind. And then you get like your developer direct in the beginning of the year. It's like, here's kind of a little a little way to say, hey, it's the beginning of the year. This is how we're going to, this is how we want to set the stage for what our platform is going to look like this year. And it's, it's really nice. And you know, you get the little accents here and there with Summer Games Fest and the Game Awards and stuff like that. But it's really quite nice that Xbox has fallen into this nice groove of how to present their, their games to the audience, how to set the expectations. Like these kinds of games are for this showcase. These kinds of games are for that showcase. And uh, I, I quite like it. So forgot completely that they did one of these last year, but yeah, late last week they were like, "Hey, stay tuned. Next week we're gonna do another one of these things." I was like, "Oh fuck yeah, that'll be that'll be great." And so this week, really the big news story is honestly we got some good news. Toys for Bob going independent. That's good news. We'll get into that. I know it's controversial for some fanboys, and we'll talk about it. I think there's some reasonable perspectives as to why it might be an iffy move, but I'm I'm mostly excited about that. We got uh, new third party games and Game Pass content to talk about. So it's a it's an overall good good week guys wow no one no one you know at least the news this week isn't like xbox died xbox got in a car crash and everyone got laid off so that's nice so that's that's really exciting all right let's start out real quick by talking about some notable games coming to the xbox platform this week some things we're talking about the first one outlast trials um I really liked the first Outlast game and then never played the second one, but always wanted to. And then I know they made like a couple of developer Red Barrel. I know they made a couple other Outlast games, but for some reason, my brain is stuck on the number three. And I feel like there's only three Outlast games. And the third one is Outlast Trials. And they have been talking about this game since 2016 or something like that. I know that's not true, but for some reason in my mind, that's that's where we are is Outlast has been like they just been re-releasing the third game repeatedly for like a decade at this point uh but anyway outlast trials i don't know if this is the fourth the fifth entry i don't know if this is a compilation i don't know what the fuck this is but it's the latest outing uh in the outlast series uh comes to xbox one and series consoles as well as pc as of the time you're listening to this it's already, it's already out so just go go ahead and jump into that if that's something you're looking forward to another notable game here's wwe 2k24 comes to both again same same three PC, Xbox One, and Xbox Series. Um, again, it is out as of the time. Actually, no, it's not out as of the time this is going live. It, it's out this Friday. So if you're listening to this on Thursday, you, gee whiz, you're just going to have to wait another 24 hours. I don't have to tell you. Uh, it's, it's worth mentioning. I know the I know wrestling games are, are quite popular, not only among wrestling fans, but even in some cases with fighting fans. And I don't know. Like I know there's a lot of people who aren't even necessarily wrestling fans that just like wrestling video games. So, yeah, I mean, maybe this is a I feel like this is a big deal. So let's 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 mention it. And then the last one I want to mention um, isn't uh, an Xbox release for this week. But it's like an Xbox second party game that's coming to PlayStation. So I just want to note this because when it when this was first announced to be happening, we, we talked about it briefly, but I didn't really go into it. But as dusk falls, the I don't know, what do you call it? the decision action based narrative game that came out two summers ago, it was summer of 22 is coming to PlayStation four and five this week. It comes out on Thursday. And I don't know. I think this is it's kind of weird that this happened. This is another perfect example of just the kind of nature Xbox has with their second party games versus PlayStation because Xbox is always very much, you know, second party being the first party Xbox in this case puts out money to a studio that they don't own. In this case, you know, well, actually, I don't remember the name of the developer of As Dusk Falls. So let's just say, uh, you know, like like Sunset Overdrive, Microsoft first party gives Insomniac a second party, a company they don't own money to make a game exclusively for their platform. Whereas a third party would be like a game made by a different company where they choose to put it on Xbox. So like a game like Far Cry or Call of Duty. Well, Call of Duty doesn't count anymore. A game like Far Cry, uh, you know, or Madden or whatever, you know, these are third party games. So just just for context. So as Dusk Falls is is honestly Xbox doesn't get too many of these these days. A a somewhat rare second party game where Xbox didn't make it no a team that Xbox owns didn't make the game but Xbox put out the money and published the game so it was an exclusive for their platform and uh, I guess after a year or whatever the timed exclusivity deal is we don't we don't know we don't have the 
we don't have the behind the scenes knowledge of what that was. Um, they were allowed to take this game and move it over to wherever the hell they wanted to. So the developers self-publishing this game on PlayStation is not being published by Xbox. Um, so this isn't like, oh, Xbox is bringing another game to PlayStation. This is the developer is called Interior Night. That's that's the name. But this is Interior Night self-publishing the game now and bringing it to PlayStation um, after a while of it being an Xbox exclusive. Whereas, uh, you know, anytime a second party game comes, a second party game comes to PlayStation, it pretty much, not always, but usually never comes to Xbox. Although this week, again, in keeping with the good news we got rolling this week, we got a long-standing PlayStation exclusive coming to Xbox. Uh, although it's one we've known about in the form of Final Fantasy XIV, which we'll talk about that a little more uh, later in the show. But those are your notable games of the week to mention. And with that said, let's start off this week with some mildly amusing, uh, uh, mildly amusing stories, updates, smaller news stories, just to kind of set the stage. Let me take a sip of coffee here. My girlfriend made me this nice cup of coffee. Her, my, my, my sister's uh, younger, my, my sister, my girlfriend's younger sister. I promise. I know I'm from Georgia, but I'm not dating my sister. My girlfriend's younger sister used to work at Dunkin' Donuts when she was in high school. And she learned how to make like all these fun little like iced latte style drinks. And she gave us this, uh, the instructions on how to make this like really fun iced coffee with like French uh, vanilla syrup and like how to do the foam and everything with the heavy cream. And it's not, it's not healthy coffee, but uh, that, that doesn't need to be said. Okay, let's get back to the news. So I feel energized. I feel, I feel caffeinated today, even though it's been a long day. I'm ready to talk about Xbox because I have knockoff uh, Dunkin' Donuts to get me through it. All right, so first story, I, I mean, I guess this kind of goes against my um, what I've said earlier about no longer talking about this game until they show something, but uh, Dragon Age Dreadwolf is back in the news. So from VGC, here we go. EA and Bioware are reportedly confident that Dragon Age Dreadwolf will be released this year. That's according to Giant Bomb journalist Jeff Grubb, speaking on the Game Mess Decides podcast with co-host Mike Minotti. Minotti. I guess this is a technicality because it's not EA and Bioware talking about the game. This is reporting on the game. Grubb says, quote, I suspect Dragon Age Dreadwolf will probably pop up this summer. I don't know when it will be shown, but I assume it will be shown sometime this summer. Um, on the potential release window for the game, Grubb said, it'll be released this year, last I heard. EA are pretty confident about that. That doesn't mean it's a guarantee. It could slip, but right now, internally, they're expecting it to release this year. A full reveal of Dragon Age Dreadwolf is scheduled this summer, according to EA. Now, I think this was always, this was my uh, guess I've said on the podcast, is that we will get a reveal for this game, a proper gameplay reveal um, this summer. Probably at Summer Game Fest, but I don't know, may, I I doubt it comes to the Xbox Showcase. Maybe Xbox has some kind of marketing deal with EA for this game, but I doubt it. I'm sure this is going to be a Summer Game Fest um, announcement or reveal. But yeah, I fully, I fully expect that. But you know, whatever they're going to put a, they're going to put a fall or holiday 2024 20, um, release on the end of the trailer, and then it, that you better fucking believe that game will still come out next year. I promise you that. But. I don't know. I, I know I said we weren't going to talk about this game until they had something like legit to show like a, an actual trailer, an actual release date. But I feel like this is, you know, this is reporting and it, it is news in some way. So I don't want to hate this game. I'm not trying to be a dick, you know, especially the more and more I get into uh, kind of this back catalog of of Western style open world role playing games. You know, I'm playing a lot of Wasteland 3 in recent years. I've gotten into more Bethesda style games and stuff like that. I feel like there's room for maybe one day Dragon Age being a series I dip my toes in and, and even who knows like. Uh, I mean, God knows the Mass Effect games have been high on my backlog forever. So I, I'm not trying to be a hater to Dragon Age. It's just that everything about the behind the scenes going on at, at Bioware is just so fucking laughable. And, and the fact that they just won't shut up about Dragon Age and, and Mass Effect, but they never have anything to show. They always have something to say, but they never have anything to show. It's just like, just, just, just shut up. No one cares. But I said that many times before, and I need to stop talking like that. So Dragon Age Dreadwolf, hopefully that's the case. We see it this summer. I kind of doubt it comes out this year, but I, I'm sure that is their internal plan. Not to say Jeff Grubb is, is falsely reporting and not to say that EA doesn't intend for it to release this year, but I don't personally believe it will come out this year because it's just one of those games where it's like 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 skull and bones i'll believe it when i see it but who knows hopefully i'm wrong uh all right moving on towerborn's first twitch stream so uh this is an xbox second party game uh towerborn uh developer stoic studio which is not an xbox team but the game is being funded and published by xbox game studios so stoic studio chief executive officer trisha stofer stu st st yeah, so far, like the frozen meal, right? Anyway, co-founder and chief creative officer Arnie Jorgensen and game director Daniel McLaren are all 
doing a Twitch stream. It's actually today. It's around the time. Is it today? No, it's tomorrow. It's the day the podcast goes live at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So the day, if you're listening to this podcast, the day this goes live this evening at 5 p.m. Eastern time, the Towerborn Twitch channel will be hosting a, a gameplay discussion, developer diary, gameplay commentary reveal thing. And they'll talk about the game's art direction, the game, the gameplay mechanics and all that stuff. Um, but the, the big reason I'm bringing this up is because hopefully... Uh, we get some good news, maybe even a release date, although I don't know that this is really the place to to, to do that. Um, so I just wanted to put this out there it's that, that, you know, this is a game you're looking forward to. This is an Xbox uh, 2024 game that you're excited about. I, I, so I definitely am. I think Towerborn looks really great. This is the new game from the guys that make the Banner Saga games. Um, it looks like a like RPG elements injected into a side-scrolling brawler with... Uh, that, that's got a little more depth to it. It's not just mindless, like, keep moving to the next level kind of stuff, but... I, this game looks phenomenal. It's a it looks like a really fun couch co op kind of um, action packed, you know, arcade style classic game that I would very much like to waste ten to fifteen hours of my life playing. So uh, I'm I'm just putting this out there to say I'm keeping my eyes on this game. I'm very excited about this game, and hopefully we get some good info as a result of this Twitch stream. So you know, keep your eyes peeled if that's something you're also looking forward to. And then finally, story of my own music I want to touch on. Before we get into the actual show, what I've been playing, the the news of the week, the Xbox Design Lab, where you can make your custom Xbox controller, is getting even better from the Xbox Wire, uh, straight from the vault, where we are thrilled to unveil an all-new Xbox Wireless controller, Fallout, ready for your exclusivity at Xbox Design Lab. I don't know, is that a pun? What is that? Get ready to dive into the immersive world of one of gaming's most beloved franchises. This Fallout-themed controller is a heartfelt tribute to the iconic characters of the series we all adore. Vault Boy, showcasing each unique special traits. These are available now. I guess that description doesn't really do a whole lot for audio only. But, uh, yeah, these look awesome. So there's these... Uh, I don't know if you get to customize them entirely like you do with the Xbox Design Lab generally, or if you get to pick one of these four pre-made designs. But is this a uh, white controller with all this, like, like fallout sketch art on it with all these like little uh, vault boys and stuff all over it doing these different animations or I guess these different little poses and stuff. And then uh, you can, I guess you can customize the buttons to be like red or green or blue or whatever the fuck color you want. But uh, it looks really cool. And if you're a fallout fan, this is a really cool new controller that you get to somewhat customize while also get this limited edition fallout controller. So Pretty awesome. Just thought I'd throw that out there. As always, Xbox Design Lab just continuing to do really cool stuff. It's actually awesome. There's the little the little vault boy, and he's at a terminal, like one of those Fallout computer terminals. And the terminal has the Xbox logo. And there's one. He's in a hazmat suit, and he's at a at a table, and it has an Xbox Series X on it or a, a Series S on it. Um, so it's got like little Xbox references in there as well. And there's a there's one vault boy, and he's holding an Xbox controller and stuff like that. So it's pretty fun. You get all the different attributes and skill character designs and stuff on there. So. I don't know. I think I think it's pretty fun. Uh, there's also a SpongeBob Xbox that's coming out for like a limited. I don't. I don't give a shit about that one. But anyway, just thought I'd throw that out there as uh, the Xbox Design Lab continues to be like one of the top best things about Xbox. Weirdly enough, which is kind of. I don't mean that as a as a downer. I mean that as like a, a compliment. But anyway, let's move on, guys. We got lots of exciting stuff to talk about. So, moving on from the opening news stories and into the what I've been playing this week. I'm very excited to talk about the game I've been playing. But before I can tell you about the games I've been playing this week, I gotta first tell you about what it is I've been eating because I also have something exciting to talk about in this uh, in this realm as well. Mister Malg writes in and says, "Don't worry, Jesse. As a proud owner of two handhelds, I support your decision to get into the Tencent G Cloud." All jokes aside, you made a valid point for why a handheld like this makes sense for you. Also, I hope you went to Taco Bell and tried the new chicken crispinata. I very much enjoyed it. All right, we'll get back to that Tencent G Cloud and all that stuff because, yes, I have I have to talk about that. But first, the Taco Bell chicken crispinata. Oh, boy. So... This came out uh, one or two weeks ago, and I and I avoided it because I'm just I'm just trying not to eat fast food wherever possible. I'm just trying to be a good boy, get back into calorie counting, just trying to be mindful, you know, keep my blood pressure and my cholesterol and everything in check. But Taco Bell's got a lot of exciting food items coming out this year, and I had to give at least one of these things a try. So I did head on over to Taco Bell one one particularly stressful day at work, um, and just said, you know, I'm going to get myself one of these as a way to celebrate me because I fucking hate today. And I tried one of these things, and you know what? I had the lowest of expectations because trusted fast food YouTuber, Review Bra, Report of the Week, if you don't follow him, goddamn, you should. He's, he's amazing. 
um, was was he he ate one of these things and he was like really down on it. And it seems like most people, uh, most most people's reaction from what you can find online is that yeah, these things are pretty disappointing. It's a it's an empanada, it's a crispy empanada, uh, but the inside is just tons of cheese and shredded chicken and all that stuff. And it comes with a side of Taco Bell's spicy ranch to dip it in. And it's the same spicy ranch they give you when they bring back those chicken rollers every once in a while, those little chicken taquito knockoff things they make. Um, which, uh, ironically, with the chicken taquito things they make usually once or twice a year, um, the only good thing about those, those things kind of suck, but the only good thing about them is the spicy ranch they give you to dip it in. It's very, it's very good. Um, but with this, I'm happy to report that despite everyone's seeming negativity surrounding this item, um, I did not have a similar experience. I actually thought this this chicken crispinata, this chicken cheese empanada thing at Taco Bell is actually... While not phenomenal, while not fabulous, not not a top Taco Bell item, stop what you do and go grab it. It's much better than I expected, and it is you know it's worth an it's worth a novelty try. If you're going to Taco Bell anyway because you have a problem similar to me, it's worth trying at least once. I'd say throwing in you know for three bucks, it's quite a large empanada, and it's it's pretty decent. The one I got wasn't uh, you know wasn't burnt or anything, and I felt like it, you know wasn't cold on the inside. Or and one of the many concerns I guess that could come to fruition with something like an empanada, especially at a fast food restaurant. So I found it to be you know, a little oily, a little bland in terms of like the chicken not really coming through. It was just a lot of cheese and crispy uh, um, empanada shell, but it's quite good, and it comes with that spicy ranch that I love so much. So. That's that's fine. That's really all I had to say about that. It's not not bad. But Taco Bell does have some food items coming out this year that I am much higher on. Now, if you want if you want to try something new at Taco Bell, and I talked about this last time I went there. If you want to try something new at Taco Bell that is worth dropping everything and getting the new value menu crispy chicken or no the the chicken flatbread thing that's awesome, and the new stacker which is like uh it's like a a simple quesadilla but folded up into one triangle so it's like a fat quesadilla that thing is awesome it's just beef and cheese but i always add you can add onion in it for like 20 cents and it makes it so much better so dude those items the new value menu at taco bell so good so anyway that's it for what i've been eating mr mallard thank you for writing in. i'm glad you enjoyed it as well so listen your favorite youtubers aren't always right about everything sometimes you got to formulate your own opinions i guess that's the moral of the story but with that said, let's let's move on over into the what I've been playing because yes, we must talk about the Tencent G Cloud. Now, I'm playing the same two games primarily that I was playing last week: um, Dead Island 2 and Wasteland 3. Um, I'll start with Dead Island 2 because I really don't have anything new to say about this game. Um, I am playing it in conjunction with Wasteland 3, but it is m definitely my secondary game I'm playing. Like Wasteland 3 is the is the main focus for me right now. And Dead Island 2 is like the thing I'm playing kind of in the background a little bit, although I suspect once I finish Wasteland 3, I'll probably go full hog into Dead Island 2, wrap that up, um, because it is, it's good, I'm enjoying it, but I just have nothing more to say about this week that I didn't say last week. It is just, you know, if you've played a game like this before, you will like this game as, you know, if, if you like Far Cry or Dying Light or games like that, you will like Dead Island 2, it is a great get for Game Pass, it's a lot of fun, um, it doesn't reinvent the wheel by any stretch of the imagination, but... That's not always what you need. Sometimes you just need something that's pure fun, and this game is pure fun. So we'll talk about that more once I've made more of a dent in it, you know, maybe once I've beaten it. Uh, but Wasteland 3 is the main thing I've been playing, and I have been primarily playing it on my, as Mr. Malg says, Tencent G Cloud, although it's the Logitech G Cloud. I have been primarily playing it there, although I will say I, I experimented with it this week. I tried streaming it downstairs on my Xbox Series X, I tried downloading it to my Series S and playing it there, and I downloaded it on my PC and played it there because I wanted to run a couple of tests. I'm just trying to see how good the Logitech G Cloud is, and and spoiler alert, it's phenomenal. Streaming on that thing is so good, um, but obviously you notice it's just a little, when you stream, it's just a little bit fuzzy compared to when you play the game natively off your console, and so I just wanted to see what the fidelity difference is, you know, what I'm losing by playing it on a handheld via streaming, um, so that's why I downloaded it to my Series S. I actually ended up playing it for a couple hours on the Series S just because it was nice to experience it that way. Um, and then on PC, I, I wanted to play it that way because I was like, you know, I feel like this is a classic PC style RPG and I want to see what the keyboard mouse experience is like. And two things. One, this game was before cross progression on all Xbox games, I guess, because it doesn't have cross progression and that sucks. So I couldn't play it on PC because, you know, I couldn't stick with the PC at least because I would have had to restart my whole profile. And two... Um, I actually prefer movement on the console version way more than the PC version because I don't like point and click movement 
on a game where you should just be able to have free free reign over how you move. So anyway, that's all aside stuff. We don't really need to get into that. But the Logitech G Cloud, I'll just say real quick, I still fucking love this thing. I played around a little bit with Halo Infinite, a little bit of Gears of War, um, uh, the, the remastered one from a few years back. And I've been playing some Hot Wheels Unleashed on it, just, you know, testing different games on it. And everything I play on this thing blows my mind. Like, I really didn't think twitchy FP- FPS type games would be good on it. I even, like, used it to remote play from my Xbox to, to play some Modern Warfare 3 to test that out. And even though I would definitely not prefer to play a game like Call of Duty that way, um, it was surprisingly a pretty not terrible experience. And, you know, if forced to do so, I wouldn't have a bad time playing that way. So I really got to give it to this little device for, you know, I bought one refurbished on eBay for 200 bucks. And for, for that price, I think this thing was worth every fucking penny. And I, you know, this past weekend, I got to live out the fantasy of watching hockey on the big TV downstairs while playing, you know, while playing Wasteland 3 on the Logitech G Cloud. And that combination was absolutely sublime i really enjoyed it and uh i I very much look look forward to using this thing a whole lot more i i I don't know i it's too soon to tell i've only had it for like a little like a over a week now so who knows maybe it's just the honeymoon phase but i suspect that this is a device that will actually find its way into my regular gaming rotation um quite a bit probably probably indefinitely but you know again i could be wrong uh, maybe that's not the case i definitely do it definitely does live up to my expectation that there are some games that this is just going to be perfect for and some games I just really prefer to not experience that way. So like if I were playing like a new halo game, you know, or like this, this fall when, um, I don't know, like what's going to be a good game. Like when Indiana Jones comes out, those are games I'm really going to want to sit down on the couch in front of the big TV installed on my series X best fidelity possible. Like th- those are games I want to experience that way, you know, but you know, for like a RPG with like a double a budget, that's like a, you know, classic PC style CRPG, this, that shit's great for this device. You know, if I'm playing a racing game, if I'm like replaying a game I've played before just to kind of like, you know, get some enjoyment, like I'm just replaying Gears of War or something, this device is perfect for that. You know, I'm playing a little indie game or a little, just testing out some things that have come to Game Pass recently. This device is perfect for all that stuff. And honestly, I think it's worth every penny. Again, uh, knowing that I'm not the kind of guy who's going to want to take this device with me and go around town, although I do still want to take it to Disney to see if I can... Uh, if I could see, see if I could stream games, um, using Disney's terrible public Wi-Fi um, from inside a theme park, because I feel like that would be a fun test to run. Uh, that's not how I would intend to use the device regularly. So again, as an at-home only, laying in bed, laying on the couch kind of device, I fucking love this thing. It's great, and it's really, I feel like, enhancing my experience of Wasteland 3. But Wasteland 3 is the main game I want to talk about here. And I gotta say, I'm about 12, 13 hours into the game. Um, ended up not having quite as much time to play this week as I as I hoped, um, but I still kept looking for excuses to boot up the game and trying to get a couple minutes in here, an hour in there, as much as possible. And I am just absolutely infatuated with this game to the point where I will say, and I know it's early, it's only March, but I will be shocked if this game doesn't end up... Be- Actually, no, no, let me take that back. As of now, this game is firmly my favorite game I've played of 2023. Uh, it, like when we get to December and we talk about the best games I played the year, uh, this game as of now is a hundred percent that number one game. Now I'm very excited for Avowed. Um, I'm excited for Stalker Two. I'm excited for Indie, but I don't think Indie will be that game. So you know there there are other games I'm really looking forward to. So I'm not going to say definitively this is probably my game of the year, but so far it is a really firm contender for like favorite game I've experienced this year. I I don't you know. We, I joked about Ghost Recon Wildlands earlier and how it's like I've, I've tried it multiple times. I keep thinking it's going to click and it never clicks. Wasteland 3 was one of those games. I played it one time when it first came out, booted it up, didn't get it, deleted it, moved on with my life. And here I am a few years later giving it another go. I'm like, what the fuck did I not see in this game before? This game is just phenomenal. It's so good. It It, it does. It's the same magic. And now I'm getting that context for how, you know, in exile and in Bethesda and all these teams are kind of interrelated, you know, the guys like Brian Fargo and in, in, in the fall universe and the Bethesda games and all that. And you start to see like the DNA and the cross pollination behind these kinds of games in these studios, because the thing that makes wasteland three so special is the exact same. It's the exact same special sauce that makes Skyrim and Starfield and fallout three and all these kind of games 
so special, which is just, it's like once you take the time to just sit with the game for a couple hours, you get so incredibly steeped in the world. And the reason why I'm so taken back that games can do this is because I usually have such like fucking ADHD with games. It's like, I don't usually let a game sink its teeth into me too much from the sense of, I like, I like action. I want to keep the pace going like next mission, next mission. I want to feel constantly like I'm making progress. Like I'm getting closer to the credits and like I'm putting a dent into the game. Um, and it's very rare where a game where I, I'm playing a game. I'm like, I really want to just stop and explore. I really want to just see what that NPC has to say. I know it has nothing to do with the main quest line, but I really want to see what that guy has to say. Or like, I wonder what's over here. If I just explore like, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to take on this stupid fucking side quest that I don't need to take on right now and stop everything I'm doing in the main quest line because I'm genuinely curious and invested and I want to see where that goes. I don't ever feel that in games. Like when I play, you know, more standard open world games like like Far Cry or like a superhero game like Spider-Man or something, I'm very much like, yeah, I don't give a shit. I just want to fucking next cutscene, next cutscene, next mission. Where are we going? I want to see the main, the main attraction. I want to see the meat and potatoes of the experience. But with Wasteland 3, it's like... I know it's daunting. I know it's a 40 hour game, roughly, if you're just playing through the main content. But and I know it's really hard for me to get the time to play all the games I want to play and that it's a it's a big investment to commit myself to a game like this. But even so, when I'm playing this game and I'm working through one mission and then like I travel to a new city and then the the, the comms come on and someone's like, oh, we're being attacked over here in Denver. Please come over and help us if you can. And it's like usually in a game, I'm like, I don't give a shit. I'm going to keep doing the main quest line. But this is one of those very rare games where I'm like, huh, yeah, I, I will abandon the main quest right now to go off on, on the uh, off the beaten path and see what this side quest is all about. Because I know the character interactions are going to be great, the exploration is going to be rewarding, and and the way it will enrich the game, both by, you know, the way the decisions impact everything else in the game, and by, you know, the fuller sense of, like, commitment and understanding I'll have to this world, I know it's going to be so worth it. And I, I just never feel that way in games. It's very rare for me. So I'm getting that feeling, just like I did last year with Starfield, where I'm like, yeah, I, I give a shit about all the crevices and ins and outs and side stuff, because it's just all good shit. Um, it's just, I, I really love this game. I love, uh, you... Like it blows my mind from I, I can't stop thinking about while I'm playing this game from a developmental standpoint, how you even create a game like this, where it's just like every fucking thing you do constantly affects everything else. And it's it's frustrating sometimes because you're like, God damn it, I didn't want that to happen. But it's also like just so impressive that's like, damn, I really didn't I really didn't think interacting with something so minuscule as like this random NPC would affect the main quest line. And then the way these people view me and then the way these people treat me and the dialogue options I get with this faction, all that stuff. But like everything has consequence and it's all fun. It's like, I don't know. I'm just in the right mood with it where I'm like, okay, I'm here for it. Okay. Things change. I guess this is what we're doing now. You know, it's like, I was going to travel to this city to talk to this faction, but I got intercepted by this faction and they told me this information that's conflicting with the other guys. And now I'm kind of on these guys' side. So I guess, I guess the, I guess the quest has changed. And now we're going to take out the guys I was supposed to help instead of go help them. And it's, it's like crazy shit like that, where you're just constantly along for the ride, but the, the world is always evolving and expanding and, and you're just getting more and more down the rabbit hole, but it's fun. Like, I don't, I don't care. I know that. Yeah, I've been playing for 13 hours, but I'm not 13 hours through the main quest line. I'm like six hours through the main quest line because I'm fucking around and I'm doing other stuff and it's worth it. So I'm really loving Wasteland 3. I, I just hope that I'm able to get enough time committed to this game that I can really see it through in a way that feels very comprehensive without it like taking half the year out of my life so that I can't play other games. Um, and, and that's like the bittersweet thing about this game is like I, I want to play through it and then be like, Fuck, you know what I need to do? I need to finally play Fallout New Vegas. You know what else I want to do? I want to go back and play Wasteland 2. I want to go back and play the original Fallout games because those are on PC Game Pass and see what those are all about because, you know, that will give me a, a much more historical co- understanding and, and under you know, context for what this genre is and what these games are and where these IP come from. And, you know, it's just, I want to be educated and, and exposed to that, that video game history. But it's just with how much it's going to take me to get through this game the way I want to. Uh, it's like, I just don't see how I'll have the time to play any of those other games, let alone the many other games in my backlog. I still want to play Atlas Fallen and, you know, the stalker stuff that just came to Xbox, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It's like, it's, it's overwhelming, but it's a good overwhelming. It's just, it's really, really nice. Um, this game is just, it's just wonderful. I mean, I'll, I'll leave it on this note right now in the main quest line, 
I'm in Denver and I'm siding with a race of AI robots because they are more humane than the humans who worship a, a statue, a robotic statue called President God Ronald Reagan, who can shoot laser beams out of his fucking eyes. I'm like, that's like, that's like everything Fallout does times two. That's like way, it's way funnier. <laughs> it's way more ridiculous and over the top. And I just love this, like, this, like, self-aware, stupid, but also somewhat, like, cool alternate U.S. history where, you know, some aspects of it feel like believable and grounded and crazy and aw- like just really cool. And then some parts of it are just absolutely balls to the wall, silly and stupid and fun. And it's just, it's so great. So wasteland three, I recommend this game so much. I would say, I would say if you're like old Jesse and you're probably just sitting around playing Sonic unleash for the 400th time, go ahead and finish up your playthrough. Sonic unleash is phenomenal shit. But when you're done, maybe give wasteland three a try. Don't sleep on this shit. Even if it's not your kind of game, uh, I guess the moral of what I'm trying to say is you should like the games I like when I say they're good. And Wasteland 3, right now, is good shit. So, um, But joking aside, th- this game just makes me so much more hyped for uh, a Clockwork Revolution in Exile's new game because this will be the first time we've been able to see this team get, like, fuck you money in a proper development cycle and the ability to have AAA money to make a big, big game. And I almost wonder if some of the charm of, of what they do will be lost in a game like Clockwork um, Revolution because so much of what I love about Wasteland is it's kind of like text adventure kind of charm where like, you know, the game's top down, isometric, not very pretty. So sometimes you'll walk up to an NPC and like you can't see the expression on their face. But so it does like that D&D style like text adventure shit where it'll be like you open your hand to to, to hand the uh, mechanical pieces to to Johnson and Johnson look, looks at you disappointed as he realizes you've gathered the wrong parts. You know, just I'm, I'm making shit up just to say like, you know, it does that kind of like that, that text adventure stuff to fill in the blanks for the lack of budget to do facial animations and like proper cinematics and things like that. And so there's so much of that, that in a weird way is additive to this very, this very deep lore and this very um, compelling universe they built. And I feel like when you have the budget to make like an Elder Scrolls style game, like they're going to have with Clockwork Revolution, I almost wonder if you start to lose some of that charm because this game's just going to have modern AAA budget to fill in the blanks of, of some of the more budget conscious, like charming things they had to do in games like Wasteland 3. But that's more of like a hypothetical nitpick. Who knows if it's even a real problem? I'm just very excited for that game now because... I see, I see this, I see the magic in a studio like in Exile, and the past few years had just been a, a wild ride for me because I never in a million years would these kinds of games be the kind of thing I, I I thought I would like at all. But I mean, here I am today. I'm like fucking Bethesda and Obsidian and in Exile, and hey, they're all they all got a seat at Team Xbox, so they're making great games, and it's all coming to Game Pass, and it's all on the platform I play on. So it's good shit, man. Like this is just more really great stuff. And also, just as a side note, one more time, I'll say it: Wasteland Three was kind of like a swan song game for the Xbox One, along with Gears Five. So just more proof that the Xbox One was a great generation and just gets so much dog shit for no reason. So just want to put that out there. Hashtag team Xbox one was great, but that's it for what I've been playing. You guys, let's take a quick break, come right back and we'll talk about the Xbox partner preview and all the fun announcements we have to look forward to as a result. All right, guys, let's just jump right into the news with, uh, starting with the Xbox partner preview. So as of the time of recording this, we're just a few hours removed from the event. It was a 30 minute live stream going over four, was it 14 games? Yeah, 14 games. Some of them new announcements, some of them updates, uh, some of them, you know, just updates on current games that are already out, like DLC and stuff like that. But yeah, it was, I don't know, all in all, I feel like my expectations were meh. And I feel like the outcome of the show was like fine. It wasn't a bad showing. Um, it wasn't anything I was like losing my shit over. I feel like, you know, with a, with an event like this, where it's not like the summer games showcase or whatever event where it's like their main splash, as long as I can find like a couple of things I care about, I'll consider that a win. So like, that's kind of how I feel about this. Like it's, it's, it's third party, just additional stuff, a couple of game pass games. So it's 14 games overall. Of those 14 games, six of them are Game Pass games. 
and you know, for, I, I think from that perspective, I'm a little more like meh. But there's two games for sure I really give a shit about here. Uh, there's one game I'm kind of like, yeah, I'll give that a try, especially because it's a Game Pass game. And then there's one game I'm like curious about, but I don't know if it'll be for me. But overall, I feel like that's that's pretty good. And there's a little, there's kind of a little something for everyone here. I feel like I don't know. Let's just let's just jump into it because it's again, this is all just like additive stuff. This is like you know, you're at the buffet table. As long as you got prime rib and freaking mac and cheese and all the stuff you want, I see at the buffet. You know, all the other stuff is additive. This is like the side salad and the in the dinner rolls and the stuff that's like okay, that's not the focus of the buffet, but it's nice to have that stuff there. So that's that's kind of how I I come into an event like this. So what I've done here is I pulled. Uh, from IGN, Windows Central, and VGC, they got, like, their kind of recaps of, like, everything announced at the Xbox Partner Preview just to get some details about, like, dates, developer names, things like that. But we'll basically just go in the order that Xbox showed them in. It was a 30-minute, brisk little video. I thought it was well-paced, well-managed, had nice little title cards and then music and animations going from one game to another. And most of these games didn't really overstay their welcome. Some of the Japanese games had... Uh, trailers that lasted maybe a minute or two too long, but, you know, that's just the nature of JRPG-style games is just being too long for the sake of being too long. But, yeah, for the most part, I felt like the pacing was pretty good here. So it kicked off with a game called Unknown 9 Awakening, uh, which I thought uh, is a terrible name, but this game actually looks pretty cool. This is a game from Reflector Entertainment. This is a Canadian-based studio working with, I think, Bandai Namco as the... Uh, as the publisher, but uh, this game looks pretty cool. It shows gameplay. This isn't the first time it was shown. It was announced last year, and then this is a more in-depth trailer that shows uh, gameplay where it's kind of got like this. <laughs> Again, this is why I had to pull up the trailers and everything to go alongside with it. But you play as this girl, and she's got like these powers, like these, I don't know, it's like kinetic energy powers, and then she can like take control of other people's actions, and so like it's this kind of action style gameplay where you like can move around and hide and stuff but when you want to attack or maneuver really what you do is you take control of everyone else and use them you know use their abilities or their attacks um against one another and i think that's a pretty fun looking mechanic like she'll like take command of like a couple guys will be attacking her and she'll like take control of one of them and redirect their gunfire at one of the other guys and then like grab one of the other guys and redirect like his melee attack at one of the other guys and stuff like that. So you kind of like pit the enemies against one another by commanding them, which is pretty cool. And the movement looks kind of like, you know, like typical third person action-y with the movement and everything. So it looks nice. It looks like a unique concept, a fun idea. Um, this game's coming out sometime this summer. And I feel like it's like, it's cool. It's, it's fun. It's unique. And I appreciate new ideas. Um, I just don't know that this really does much in terms of like capturing my attention making me go wow i need to play this game but it does i don't know it's like a decent opening just by way of saying like hey we're working with partners that are bringing new and interesting things that you've never seen before and and, and from that perspective i think it's a pretty good way to open the show but that's the first game i don't really have too much to say about that we don't really get into the exciting stuff from my perspective just yet the next game they show is probably the game i cared the least about and really just because this game didn't get any gameplay whatsoever uh, this is literally just a uh, this is just a CG trailer. But the next game they showed is Sleight of Hand. It's a game from Joshua Boggs, who is known for the mobile game Framed, which I know nothing about. That's from IGN. Uh, it is a noir stealth game uh, with a card mechanic, although I don't know if it's like card battling system or what, because again, they didn't show gameplay. So it's really hard for me to really know and care about this in any way, shape or form. Uh, but the one notable thing about this game is it is the first game they've showed that is a Game Pass title. So it'll be released for PC and Xbox consoles through Game Pass. Uh, although they didn't put a date on it, they just said sometime next year. So this is a 2025 game, uh, which makes sense. If you're not going to show gameplay, it's probably, you probably got a ways off before the game is ready to be shown. Uh, but yeah, I mean, th yeah, it's got a noir kind of like dark style. I think the, the town's called, no, that's a different game I'm thinking of. Yeah, it's just, um, I don't know. It's got, it's got like just a weird, dark, creepy look and it's apparently a card battle game. So I just really have nothing to go off of. So really no judgment on whether or not it looks good or bad. It's just, what, next time they show the game when they have gameplay, uh, we could talk about it in that context. But until then, it's just we know this game is coming as some kind of card battle mechanic, but it also has stealth gameplay, and it is a Game Pass game. So that's really all there is to say about it. From here, I feel like we start to get into the more interesting stuff, uh, beginning with uh, The Alters, which is a new game from 11-Bit Studios. Um, there's no release date for this one, but this is 
I believe, also another Game Pass game that they showed. Uh, and this game looks interesting. It, I'm not going to say it's for me necessarily, but it does look interesting. As he, you play as this guy, it takes place on like a, in, in like space, and it's a sci- sci-fi style game. But the guy ends up creating different versions of himself and trying to escape this planet. And all the different versions of him are like, you know, kind of like different interpretations of like the kind of person he could be, which I think is kind of cool. Kind of plays into like this kind of human idea of just like the, like the regrets and the different perceptions and the different phases people go through where it's like, oh, I could be this person. Or I could have done this a certain way. And it kind of gamifies that. Um, you can see in the trailer where it's like different interpretations of of the same guy where it's like he looks different or he would have made different life decisions that would have taken him different places and and kind of gamifying that with the different mechanics and the different professions and the different actions that the character takes. So I feel like, again, we've got another game here where it's like a really cool concept, a really cool mechanic idea. But it's just a matter of like, does that translate into like a game I, you know, that looks fun to play or that is fun to play? And from that perspective, I don't know because this game looks like it has a lot of like, uh, it's like a lot of like base management kind of stuff, a lot of like menu based gameplay and decision making and things like that. And like, I don't know, like I'd, I'd kind of rather just be <laughs> my stupid brain is like, oh, I, I want action, I want to like run around and jump and shoot shit. I don't want to, you know. Like the, from a narrative point of view, I like what this game is doing. But from a gameplay point of view, it's like I don't really know that this is like anything I'm gonna care about. But I do, I do really appreciate the concept of this. And again, it's it's a Game Pass game, so this is something that I'll probably have to give a try. You know, see what it's all about. Maybe it's something that will grab me. But you know, in the, in the state we're currently seeing it, it's like really cool idea. I really respect what they're working on here. Don't know that I'm gonna give a shit about this game. Then we get to okay. So the next game they showed was this uh, Creatures of Ava or Ava. Uh, which is a Spanish studio developed in Verge and Chibig. I don't know. But it's an action-adventure game uh, where players tame creatures to save the world from life-consuming infection. Uh, it is, you know, IGN called it like, oh, it's like Pal World, but with, but without the uh, action and the violence. And it's like, I, I don't know if they're just saying that. It's like, yes, you, are, you play as a human and there are creatures. It definitely has some Pokemon inspiration to it, but... Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't really understand what the gameplay loop is as a result of seeing this. Like, I don't know if it's like a linear narrative kind of game, like story game where you interact with these Pokemon type creatures or if it's like more of like a like a survival style game, like every fucking game is these days. Uh, but like it, it's got that kind of colorful art world art, art style that like you see in a lot of games, like a lot of like rare, rare, rare style games. Um, kind of like a Sea of Thieves or like an Everwild or something um, with these Pokemon creatures that don't look like Pokemon knockoffs like Power World. But also, you know, from the gameplay trailer, I just can't really gather like w- what it is we're doing here. It looks like you get Pokemon, you like save them and you get them on your side and then you go through some kind of action adventure game, but there's no like combat. Um, so I don't really know exactly what it is this game is supposed to be, but it do- it definitely looks pretty. Um, and, and from that perspective, it's like, you know, it's, it's fun to look at. I admire it. And it's another Game Pass game. So this is another one of those games that's perfectly like, I don't really know that I give a shit about this game, but it is in Game Pass. So I'll give it a try. So good get there. But here's where it starts to go from like generally interesting to like, okay, I'm, I'm cool with this. I'm like, I, I want to see about this. I want to see about this. Oh, wait, no, never mind. Take that back. There's one more announcement that I'm, I don't, I really don't give a shit about. And then we get into that. This is probably the worst. You know, I want to, I want to say I'm, I'm sorry to sleight of hand because although that game didn't show any gameplay, the worst game showed is this next one. Uh, just because I, I, I was visually, if you saw me while I was watching this, I was cringing so hard. Uh, but Roblox, I don't know what this is. It's a Roblox Chucky game. Uh, it's like a limited time event, but Griefville, which I guess is a game within Roblox, is doing a crossover with Chucky. Um, Chucky, like the like the the horror movie with the little doll that stabs you with a knife, and it's a it's Roblox meets Chucky, and I thought Roblox was for little kids, but I guess now they get to play this, and I, I don't know. I guess it's because kids are so into like spooky stuff and Five Nights at Freddy's, and then that somehow transcended into things like Dead by Daylight. So I I, I can see why there is a crossover audience for something like this, but at the same time, I feel like Chucky's a little too mature of an IP to market at a kids game, but You know what? I am pretty ignorant about everything involved with this announcement. And my hope and my dream and my desire, my deepest passion and desire um, as pertains to this is to remain as ignorant as humanly possible because uh, this 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 genuinely watching this trailer made me want to fucking die. So we'll just move on right now watching the little Roblox characters run around with the Chucky doll and uh, just everything, all the sounds, the music. 
Uh, the music was fucking god awful. So please, let's get very far away from this and uh, move on to what is um, one of the most highly praised announcements that was at the showing, uh, which is the Sinking City Two. So I didn't even know there was a Sinking City One, uh, but apparently that was a very well liked game from 2019. It's not too old, four or five years ago, and it's it's getting a sequel. So following the long battle regarding publishing rights to the original game, Frogware has finally revealed Sinking City 2, coming out next year in 2025, it is a survival horror game set in the 1920s in the U.S. Sinking City 2 will have players exploring a semi-open world powered by Unreal Engine 5. In the, addi- in the addition to the um, release window, Frogware is revealed in a press release that's planning to launch a Kickstarter campaign to help raise funds for the game um, as the Ukraine-based studio is being impacted by the uh, the war, the ongoing war. So I don't know what Sinking City is w- 1 is, and I felt stupid, you know, having to admit that because it seems like everyone on the internet was like, yes, Sinking City was so good, I can't wait for a sequel. I don't know what the fuck that is. I don't know how, I just missed all of that. But I, I must say, this trailer looks pretty cool. I like it. It's got all the staples of a horror game that, that piques my interest. It's got like the slow flashlight kind of shit going on. It's got a really creepy, cool world. It's not just bloody and gruesome for the sake of violence. Uh, it's got like a gothic kind of flair to it. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested. It looks European in the best way possible. I'll put it that way. Part of what I love so much about Alan Wake is how goddamn European it is. And this game looks to be no different in that sense. But I don't know. Call, color me interested. What's the fucking saying? How do they say it? But this is a game that I will 100% check out. The problem is, do I have to play the first one first? How, how do I play the first one? What's that all about? How, how did I miss this Sinking City trend that like everyone's talking about it? I don't know nothing about it. Now, this game is not coming to Game Pass, but I feel like this is a game that you wait for some good reviews or maybe uh, you take a chance on it. Probably won't be too expensive, but uh, it, I don't know, maybe it's like a $40, $50 game, but it looks good. It looks looks pretty fucking creepy and fun. I feel like this would be a great Halloween time game. It takes place in a city called Arkham. It's got a very gothic flair to it, which is pretty badass looking, so... I am uh I'm intrigued. I'm I'm following along with this game. I gotta I gotta do some research, go back, figure out more about the first one. Maybe I just go play the first one if it's if it's pretty much like the second and it seems like something I'd probably be interested in. So yeah, I thought this game looked really good. Kronky wrote in about it and said, I watched the partner showcase, and all I can say is the Sinking City was fantastic, and I'm super excited about it getting a sequel. And even more so because the sequel seems more survival horror than the first one. So what was the first one? A fucking character 3D platformer? Like, what What, what, did, I, what did I miss? Also, Stalker on Xbox. Woot, woot. Okay, we'll get to that in just a second. So, yeah, so Sinking City. Yeah, the first one was released in 2019. So it's not, I don't know why I, they're acting like it's so old and like they've been waiting for a sequel forever. It's just, it's like four and a half, five years. Calm down. But yeah, this game looks, this game, I have nothing more to say about it. It looks really cool. I will keep an eye out on this game. Uh, I love a good horror game. I don't know why I like horror games so much more than horror movies, but I really like horror in video games, and this looks like a pretty good horror game. So next up, Final Fantasy XIV. Now, this one's just kind of a little bit of a nudge. It's like, hey, Final Fantasy XIV, remember, we've been talking about that. So the game's already out, and it's kind of like testing beta version or whatever on Xbox. But they confirmed that the March 21 date on Xbox is the official full release of the game. They showed a trailer. um, And so, you know, we've been waiting for this game for about a year now. We've known it's been coming to Xbox for a little less than a year. But uh, this is this is it. You you can't help but think this uh, timing and this kind of marketing for this game is clearly a way of Xbox being like, hey, guys, I know that brand new Final Fantasy seven game on PS5 is pretty exciting and everyone's playing and talking about it. But we got something Final Fantasy related over here on Xbox. So uh, maybe come out and check out Final Fantasy fourteen a game that came out a decade ago. But I know people have been wanting this on Xbox forever, so this is really exciting stuff for those people. But yeah, so Final Fantasy fourteen, And then next up, we get the, the next two announcements are, in my opinion, the two best announcements of the show. Like These are the games I'm for sure most looking forward to. So the first one was something that was rumored and then leaked right before the show, but confirmed. And then there was still a surprise that wasn't spoiled. So we'll get into that. So the first three stalker games are getting remastered for modern consoles. So stalker Two: hard of Chernobyl coming out later this year, I think in September, I think September 5th is the date. So while we wait for that, the original stalker and it's two sequels are coming over from PC for the first time and coming to console so they're on xbox and and here's the part that didn't get leaked and spoiled they're out now it was a it was a gotcha moment the game the game was announced and released all at the same time 
So you can go on and buy it right now. Each game, there's all three games are there. Each game is sold for $20 a pop, or you can get all three in one package together for $40, which is, you know, if you need me to do the math for you, it's ostensibly like getting one of the three games for free. Yeah, so it's the original Stalker Shadow Chernobyl. The second one, uh, Stalker Clear Sky. And the third one, Stalker Call of uh, Pripyat. So these games were originally released for PC in 2007, 2008, and 2009 in that order. And uh, now they're just all in one collection on Xbox. And they say that they brought them back, they brought them over to console faithfully. So it's like pretty much kept in exactly the same way that they were originally in their PC form, now available on console. I am very excited about this one and a little bit peed off because I'm so like, I'm so entrenched in Wasteland 3 right now and a couple other games that I, I want to get to, including finishing up Dead Island 2 and getting to Atlas Fallen and all, all what am I? Yeah, and all, and all these games I've, I've like already got my heart set on. But if I were in a mood, if I were in a situation right now where like there's nothing to play, I don't have anything I'm really actively pursuing. I'm kind of not interested in going to my backlog right now. I'm kind of looking for the next thing to play. And this shadow dropped. I would I would download this right this second. I would be playing this right now because I very much going into Stalker 2, knowing that it's going to be a Game Pass game, knowing that it's a game that looks really good that I want to try, knowing that I love the Metro games and I would like to get context for Stalker, you know, much in the way that it's like, oh, you like Fallout? Go try Wasteland. It's like, oh, you like Metro? Go try Stalker. You know, like I want to go get that history and that experience and that understanding of this franchise. You know, I, I was lamenting a little bit that I wouldn't have any of that previous experience going into Stalker 2 this fall, but now knowing that all these games are available on my Xbox, like, that's great. I would have said, fucking sign me up. You know, I love these horror, slow-paced, first-person shooting games. Like, these, I, I really, you know, I never finished the third Metro, but those first two Metro games, I really enjoyed, especially the more linear ones. And so if Stalker, if the original Stalker games, I know they're not exactly like Metro, but if they're, you know, enough, like, you know, they speak to the same audience enough, uh, I, I feel like these are games I'm, I'm really going to care for. So this is a pleasant surprise. I'm a little frustrated. I'm not in a position right now where I can jump in and play on this and get in on the excitement and the hype of them shadow dropping. But that's that's a stupid little side comment that doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. The important thing is they're here, they're on Xbox, and now you can get caught up on the series before Stalker 2 comes out in September, which uh, I'm very excited about now. So that is a very cool announcement. And then the next game they showed, possibly... Than my most anticipated game at the showcase. I, I think in the long run, like if I played all these games, I'd probably say the, the Stalker Collection is is the is the best thing we got out of this presentation. But in the moment, the thing that hyped me up the most was this next game shown. And I know any other podcast or YouTube video you watch, people are probably gonna gloss right over this because they don't have fucking Tourette's like I do or whatever uh, would cause this. I don't know why Tourette's would be the cause of this. But the next game shown was Monster Jam Showdown. <laughs> a new monster truck racing game, a new monster jam licensed racing game. This game looks freaking awesome. It looks so good. And when they first showed it, I was like, Oh, we're getting like a monster jam Titans three. And for those who don't know, monster jam Titans is this, um, licensed monster jam series. that has been going on for a little bit. The first one came out in like 2018, 2019. And then they made another one in like 2021. I bought the second one in 2021, uh, during the pandemic. I was like, you know what? I know these are like cheap budgety little licensed games, but I'm gonna take a I'm gonna take a, a chance on this and, and, and play this um and play this first one the second one that just came out. And I bought Monster Truck Titan or Monster Jam Titans 2, and uh it was it was like okay. It was like kind of boring, but it was okay. It controlled all right. It had a lot of content, but it was kind of boring, was my takeaway from it. But, um, you know, as a little, I, I forget who made it. It was like Rainbow something. Uh, I don't know who they are. Um, but it was a cheap, budgety, licensed thing. But when I was watching the trailer for this game, Monster Jam Showdown, I was like, this game looks fucking awesome. This looks so different from the Monster Jam Titan games. Like, what, is this the same developer? Is this the same franchise? Like, what, what is this? Come to find out, this is a all new game with the Monster Jam license being made by Milestone, the Italian developer behind the Hot Wheels Unleashed games that have come out recently. And I was like, immediately once I saw that, I was like, that makes sense. Because you're looking at the trailer, the racing looks phenomenal. The environments look so fun and exciting. It's vibrant, there's color, it's it, it pops, it's it's like fun looking. And I'm like, that that makes sense. Because Milestone did such an amazing job with those Hot Wheels Unleashed games. 
um, that it doesn't surprise me at all that they're able to take that magic and then seemingly translate it to Monster Jam. So as, as someone who's just a little fucking stupid and, and for some reason is into this stuff, listen, some guys like WWE, my weird rednecky sports thing is, is, is Monster Jam. Although I don't, I don't mean to say that in like a derogatory way. That's kind of mean. That's an unfair rep. Uh, Monster Jam, pretty cool. Um, I, I wish I went to it the other week when it was in town in Orlando, but that doesn't fucking matter. This game looks great. They didn't put a release date on it. They said it will come out this year, but uh, I have every intention of jumping into this shit. I am very happy to give them 50, 60 bucks, whatever the hell they're charging for this thing, uh, because Milestone have proven themselves to be a great developer, and I want a good Monster Jam video game, and this looks like it could be it. So, uh, I was very hyped on this. It, it definitely reminded me of like, I don't know, just not, not like gameplay wise. It looks the same as, but like in the, in the spirit of like some of those, like, uh, I don't know, those like kind of like not extreme sports, but you know what I mean? Like those, those like motor sport games I used to play, like, you, you know, whether it's like a racing game, like motor storm or like a more like arcadey game, like MX versus ATV and stuff like that on like PS2 back in the day. I just, I miss those kinds of games and these, this stuff like monster jam gives me a little bit of that uh, nostalgia bump while also, you know, Monster Jam being kind of an adjacent thing to Hot Wheels, which is a weird man-child thing I have an obsession with. So I'm I'm all for this shit. Stalker Collection, Monster Jam Showdown. If that's all we got, I'd be a happy fucking pig. You know, that's all that's all I want. But yeah, we got, we got a couple other interesting things at this showcase. So I'm pretty happy with just those two things alone. Uh, next up, they should Persona 3 Reload Episode Agus, Aegis, I don't know, DLC. So I didn't know this. Apparently the Persona 3 like DLC or or roadmap stuff is all coming included with, with Game Pass as well, which is a great fucking value. Or maybe I'm misreading this and they're just saying Persona 3 Reload is in Game Pass, but the DLC is an upcharge. But I thought they were saying this DLC is included in Game Pass, which is great. But it's a free expansion thing, episode Aegis, Aegis. Um, which is which is being added to the game. That's that's great. I, I'm not gonna sit here and, and blow smoke up your butt. I don't really care. I played Persona Five a little bit last year. Thought it was pretty cool. Just knew it wasn't for me. Moved on. Um, and now I'm looking at Persona Three, and I'm like, I'm glad this is on Game Pass. I'm glad people have access to this game. Don't care. <laughs> so there's Persona Three Reload. Next game they showed looked pretty fucking badass. Um, the first it's a uh, Berserker. So let me pull up the trailer real quick. I want to be able to talk about while I look at it. Yeah, it's called the first Berserker Kazen. So th these games were announced at one point. So 11 bit is publishing it. It is, um, I don't know the franchise, but it's the dragon fighter series or whatever, or the, yeah, dragon fighter universe. I don't really know what all that's in relation to, but this game looks fucking awesome. The art style is really cool. It's got like that anime cell shade kind of look where it's like dark, but also colorful it has like really deep black lines and high contrast. And I just, and in deep saturation, and it looks aesthetically so badass. It's got like this fucking hack and slash anime style thing that looks great. The problem with the game is twofold. One, the frame rate is ass, and I can't tell if it's an artistic choice, if they're trying to go for like a Spider-Verse style 24 frame per second kind of artistic choice, or if it's like it's a game in progress, like a work in progress, and right now the frame rate just looks like shit, but it will get better over time. I can't tell, but it's... uh. Yeah, I don't know. But he here's the thing. It's it, they are touting it as a single player hardcore action RPG, which to me means it's just going to be a Souls like game. And if it's a Souls like game, again, as always, no offense. Souls games are very popular. People like them very much. Uh, I'm sure they are great. The problem is I'm too much of a fucking bitch to appreciate those games. And so I don't think this game will be for me. I want it to be for me. I want to want to play this game. I, I, I want this game to resonate with me. But I just know if it's anything like a, a grueling hard, a grueling hard like Souls type experience where it's all about mastering the parry mechanic and, and, and learning the attack patterns of the enemy, I'm going to fucking nope out of this thing so hard. It's being published by Nexon. Korean publishers getting like real hard into console gaming, which is awesome to see. And I, I don't know. I think the game just looks so fucking cool. I just, I don't know. Like, I, I wish someone could just come out and be like, it's like Devil May Cry, but with more RPG elements. I'd be like, fuck yeah, I'm playing this game day one. That, that sounds great. But watching the trailer, seeing how it's more like, you know, one-on-one -on -one combat focused kind of gameplay. I'm like, this is going to be that grueling, tough freaking souls like stuff and i i know that's not for me but the game looks so badass i i want to want this game i want to play this game and, and and to have it resonate with me but i doubt it will but i will continue to keep an eye on it because it just looks so goddamn cool uh but this game is scheduled i think to come out 
next year? They didn't really say, actually, did they? Yeah, they, they didn't say. So, just a new trailer, but hopefully... Uh, I mean, I mean, not hopefully it comes out soon. Who gives a shit? There's too many games. When it comes out, I will have my attention on this because it looks so good. Uh, all right. We're getting towards the end here, so we only got two more left. Uh, three more left. The next one they showed was Tales of Kenzira Zhao. Um, this is that game that was announced at the Game Awards, that Metroidvania game, that EA original, um, that was shown at the Game Awards. I think this game looks good. Um, I still think it looks good after seeing it for like this. I think this is like the third time we've seen it now. It looks good. It's got flair. It's got style. It's got very unique setting and characters, which I applaud and think is awesome. And it's coming out soon. It's coming out on April 23rd. But I just, I don't know what it is. I love Metroidvanias. It's a, it's a genre I have a lot of appreciation and respect for. But there are so many of these indie Metroidvanias like that people will swear by how good they are. And for some reason, just a whole lot of them don't speak to me. And this is one that looks like, you know, it's not out yet. We don't know how good or not good it is. But it looks like it falls in that camp of like another game. I fully suspect everyone's going to be like, wow, you got to play this game. It's just so good. Tales of Kinzira is just a wonderful Metroidvania. And I'm going to be like, yeah, it looks good. But I don't know why. I just have no drive to give it a go. Um, and this looks like another one of those games, but got to give them credit where credit's due. Really creative world, really fun looking gameplay, very fluid looking. Uh, it's just, I don't know. I feel like this genre is just, I feel like Metroidvania, speaking of the past two games, Metroidvania and Souls-like, I feel like are the two genres where I'm like, they're just, they're so fucking overdone in the double A indie space. I can't, I can't keep up with it. I can't care. I guess you could also say anything that's like crafting or survival based as well. I don't know. Game looks good. I just I, I just can't get hyped about it. It's all. Uh, next up, they showed Frostpunk 2, which I didn't know there was a Frostpunk 2 in development, but it's coming out July 25th. Now, this will be a Game Pass game as well, but for PC. It's not coming to console, at least not yet. I think the first Frostpunk is on console, so I assume this game will probably come to console at a later date, but PC is its primary platform, and it will come to PC in July, uh, or to Game Pass in July when it comes to PC. When it comes out now, Frostpunk is another one of those kind of reminds me of Wasteland a little bit where it's like a game where I look at it. And I'm like, that's not for me. That's not, I'm not going to like that, but I really love the aesthetic and the tone and the synopsis and everything of the game. It's just, I don't know. It's like strategy, but with base building, but with like world conquering sim stuff and choice based gameplay. I'm like, I, I don't know. It sounds a little difficult and overwhelming and I, I just, I'm just going to suck at it. So I, I'm no, I'm going to nope out of this, but I don't know, it looks really good. It's got, Frostpunk is a, is definitely a game, it's got a lot of flair, it's got a lot of uniqueness and a lot of artistic chops, but I just, I, again, it's like a game I just can't get excited about, but I want, I want to care about it. Um, but yeah, 8, 11-bit studio, they're all over this presentation. Um, so they shared a new trailer, which provides tons of pre-order information of the game uh, with the deluxe edition and all that stuff. So they're going to have a closed beta next month. And if you get the, um, deluxe edition you get access to that as well as uh, access to the story mode a few days before a game comes out so there's some incentives there for people who love the first game who are excited for the new one you got some freebies and, and good stuff to look forward to there i guess not freebies you gotta pay for it but anyway that was frostpunk 2 and then the final game they showed was this is the second time we've seen this uh this new capcom game kunitsu gami path of the goddess um so this game has been confirmed to release this year it was showed last summer at the xbox game showcase I thought this game looked pretty interesting then. I still stand by it looks pretty interesting now. And this is a Game Pass game that I will 100% give a try. I really love the idea of these kinds of like action games where you also, there's like a strategy component to it where you control like a squad or an army or something like that alongside your main character. Um, I love that about games like Disintegration and even like all, all sorts of games that do it different ways. Wonderful 101, Pikmin. Um, there are tons of different games that do this to different degrees, but I, I really love that idea. It, it does have that like weird generic Japanese monster aesthetic going on to it. Like, I don't know how really to put it, but it's like, it's like there's a, I don't know where it comes from. I don't know like what Japanese mythology or, or lore it comes from, but there's just this kind of Japanese monster art language that is very much like, you know, it's like this corporal monster look where like flowers are spouting out of enemies heads and it's like horses mixed with humans and everything's like bony and fleshy and they you know everything i don't know how to put it it's like uh that game i played a few years ago what was it called scarlet nexus that was it yeah like kind of like that the way like the characters and the creatures look in games like scarlet nexus i don't know what it is it's a it is very clearly a japanese 
character style that's popularized and like this game has it with its monsters where like i don't know like it, it's kind of cool the first time you see it and then every other time you see it i'm like oh this again and you know it's like where it's like they got like fucking house like home goods decorations like dangling from their fucking faces and stuff it's like oh he's a pot with arms and like a long tongue and something like that it's like what what, what is this shit what it what is like this shinto inspired monster art form that i like just my western brain can't comprehend but aside from that that gripe the gameplay looks fun it looks frenetic it, look, it looks frantic it looks action-packed i love the hack and slash combat and then like the using of different abilities but then also controlling like your units around you to attack enemies so i love the combination of all of those things sounds so fun and this is a really fun game pass game that like you know, like it looks like the perfect kind of Game Pass experience. Something I wouldn't probably buy for 60, 70 bucks day one, but something I would definitely check out a year or two later on sale for like 20, 30 bucks. And as a Game Pass day one game, this is that kind of stuff that adds that value to Game Pass that, you know, that, that makes the service so, so great on top of the obvious like day one Xbox first party stuff. So I'm very interested in this. Last year from Capcom, we got, uh, what was that, Exo Primal. And now this year we get the, uh, uh, Kunitsugami, Path of the Goddess. So it seems like they have this kind of experimental side game thing where they put these games on Game Pass to kind of test the waters and then they sell the game on PlayStation to make some money, hopefully. And uh, I guess maybe that worked out well for Exoprimal because they're doing it again with this game or maybe they're just under contract with Xbox. But nonetheless, definitely a fun-looking uh, Game Pass game that I will totally give it a try when it comes out this year. But no specific date, just a 2024 release date. But that was the final game they showed and... Yeah, there we go. 14 games. I think it's a pretty good lineup. Again, like Kunitsugami, I'll definitely give that a try. Uh, what, what's up? The first Berserker, I really want to love it. We'll wait and see. Monster Jam Showdown, absolutely. The Stalker Collection, absolutely. Final Fantasy 14, that's really exciting for Xbox. I don't know if I'll get into that. Sinking City 2, looks pretty good. Roblox, kill me. Uh, Creatures of Ava, again, looks like a fun Game Pass game. Uh, don't really know if that it's my thing, but I'll give it a go. The altars, similar sentiment. I'll give it a go, but I don't really know if it's going to be my thing. Slide of hand. Don't know what the fuck that is really. And unknown nine, probably not going to get into it, but I definitely appreciate it for what it is. It looks pretty interesting and unique and we need more interesting and unique games in the, you know, in our ever, uh, homogenized world of gaming where there's more games than ever before, but everything's trying to be everything else at the same time. So I welcome uniqueness. So overall, pretty good, pretty good shit. I'm looking forward to it. Really happy with a, you know, a couple, you know, everything's for everyone. If you, if you watch a presentation and you find a couple things you're looking forward to, I consider that a win. So overall, pretty good partner showcase. You pair this with the indie developer showcase, you know, you got freaking sinking city Two stalker collection, uh, Monster Jam, and then from the developer direct, you got Indiana Jones, and you got Avowed, and you got Hellblade, and then we also know just of other games that are coming out inevitably, like a Call of Duty Gulf War with zombies, fucking Treyarch Call of Duty game, that's great, um, then just all the other games that are going to be coming out throughout the year that haven't been shown on Xbox's stage, like, shaping up to be a great year, uh, of course, Stalker 2 coming out this fall. We got we got lots of good shit here on Xbox. I don't you know I don't know if people are gonna start buying hardware. I don't know if Phil Spencer's gonna take all these fucking games and throw them on PlayStation in 35 seconds after they come out on Xbox. I don't know the answer to any of that, but I do know again once more for pretty much the millionth time with the, with the exception of 2022, this is yet uh, shaping up to be yet another year where I look at my Xbox. I know people say Xbox has no games. Xbox games are as good as PlayStation games. X, why would you buy an Xbox? But I'm sitting over here. I'm like. Looks fucking good to me. Can't wait to play all these games on my PC, Series S, Series X, Logitech G Cloud. I'll, I'll fuck around with all these devices. I'll play all these games. And it uh, looks like I have my year set. Plenty of good shit to look forward to playing. And that's aside from all the other games that come out this year that we don't know about yet or that we forgot about or that, you know, come up here or there. Or little gems we we happen upon that we, for, you know, didn't like the first time around, like Wasteland 3, whatever we do. I'm eating good over here on Xbox, okay? Some people like to shit on the Golden Crow. But I know Golden Krell is kind of good shit, especially if you go during a slow time when there's not too many people. It's not it's not that bad. And that's all I'm saying. Game Pass, it's like Golden Krell. It's not the best, but it's all you can eat steak for $17. Are you really going to complain? All right. We've got a couple other news stories to talk about, including what, what would have been the big story of the week if it weren't for this uh, Xbox little showcase popping out of nowhere. But uh, Toys for Bob 
this was last Thursday, so this is also the day last week's podcast went live, uh, came out with a bombshell announcement on Thursday and said, hey, we're going indie. We're going independent. We're spinning off from Activision, uh, a.k.a. Xbox. And so here's what they wrote up. This is their little release um, directly from their website, from their blog. And they say, we are thrilled to announce Toys for Bob is spinning off as an independent game developer. Over the years, we've uh, inspired love, joy, and laughter for the inner children, inner child, and all gamers. Uh, we pioneered new IP and hardware technologies with Skylanders. We raised the bar for best-in-class remasters with Spyro Reignited Trilogy. We've taken Crash Bandicoot uh, to innovate critically acclaimed new heights. And with the same enthusiasm and passion, we believe that now is the time to take the studio in the future of our games to the next level. This opportunity allows us to return to our roots of being a small and nimble studio. To make this news even more exciting, we're exploring a possible partnership between our new studio and Microsoft. And while we're in early days of development for our next games, a new way uh, and a new way from making any announcements, our team is excited to develop new stories, new characters, and new gameplay experiences. Our friends at Activision and Microsoft have been extremely supportive in our new direction. We're confident that we'll continue to work closely together as part of our future. So... Keep your horns on and your ears out for more news. Thank you to our community of players always supporting us through this journey. We can't wait to share updates on our new adventures as an indie team. Following the announcement, it was also confirmed that Toys for Bob's game released last June, Crash Team Rumble, will not be getting any more content updates following this week's final update that just came out. So that game is now being sunset. That multiplayer seasonal-based Crash Bandicoot multiplayer game is now being sunset. As far as content, the servers will be supporting. You can play it, but the content uh, drops will be coming to an end, which is fine. Sam Frito writes in and says, Toys for Bob is free. What do you think? What's the first What's the first bit of creativity they're going to bring to the gaming, and namely Xbox and Min- uh, Microsoft? Great show. Your opinions make Xbox on worth pontificating. Keep up the great work. Sam Frito. Thank you. Don't, 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 don't blow some, you know, don't be hyping me up too much. I'm, I'm, I'm a man child. I'm wearing Hot Wheels t-shirts for Christ's sake. Let's, let's tone it down. But thank you for writing in. Thank you for being a consistent supporter and commenter. We appreciate you and we love you. And also, I hope your wife and kids aren't listening. You have a absolutely massive personality that we all appreciate and respect so much. All right. Uh, first thing I just want to put it, I guess, I guess as a side note, they say, so keep your horns and eyes open for more news. Uh, definitely a Spyro reference. I'm sure many people heard that and went, Ooh, they're making a Spyro game. They're making a Spyro game. Maybe I don't fucking know. Let, let's talk about the, if, from a general perspective, what this means. I, I saw a lot of people being like, no Xbox, you're dropping the ball. Oh, I gotta go sell my Xbox and show my receipt on Twitter. So all my fans know I'm a PlayStation fan. Like fucking man, children, freaks, freaks of nature children. I saw a lot of people complaining about this, like, oh man, that sucks. Xbox finally had a good studio that they could have put to work on, like making Conquer or making a new Banjo-Kazooie or making new Spyro and Crash games. It's like, yeah, yeah to all of those things. But, um, I mean, we want to believe Phil and the heads, the, the, the leadership at Xbox when they say these kinds of things. And, and hopefully they're telling the truth when they say like, we listen to the developers, we hear what they want. We're open to reviving these old franchises and working on new things. We want to get the input of the teams and hear what they want to do and where their hearts are at. And we want to encourage them to explore new avenues and make the games that they're passionate about. And, you know, we kind of hear things to that effect from mouths like Phil Spencer all the fucking time. So, Let's look at this from the perspective of Xbox is making good on that that promise and those words and they're committed to that kind of thing because I see this as the Activision deal closed, cuts had to be made, Microsoft's got to cut back and make Activision a little bit more lean of a machine, right? And a great way to help downsize is to off some of these teams that you don't necessarily need. And my guess is that Toys for Bob, you know, and Phil and, and Matt Booty and these guys are going around, meeting with the teams, meeting with the leadership at these teams, like, where are your guys' hearts at? What is it like over here? How do you guys operate? What What are your opinions? What are your needs? You know, what do you need from us to be a, a, a you know, to have a conducive work environment? My guess is that the conversation went something like this. Hey, we made Skylanders. It was this fucking hit. That was us at our peak. It was this huge thing that came and went, but it, it was so inspirational that Disney jumped in and they tried to do their own thing with Disney Infinity. Lego jumped in. They tried to do their own thing with with Lego, whatever it's called, Lego Dimensions. And, you know, it, it, the Toys to Life thing was a fad. It was like Guitar Hero and Rock Band. It was a thing that happened, <clears throat> made tons of money. It was a 
and, and they were at the heart of it. They, they, they were the ones responsible for it with Skylanders. And that was kind of our thing. And then we got to work on these Crash and Spyro remakes collections. We got to make a brand new Crash game. We got to do Crash karting and all this all this different stuff. And it was cool. And that's kind of our wheelhouse is making like these family games and making these really good platformers and working on these classic IP. But then Activision just kept shoving us on the fucking Call of Duty and saying, can you work on, can you work on Nicki Minaj skins for Warzone so players can get their fucking groove on while they fucking get NFKs or what? I don't know what the fuck I'm saying. I play Call of Duty. I don't even know what I'm saying. And they're probably like, hey, you know what? This, uh, this kind of sucks ass to go from the heights of being like this spearheading top of their game, uh, developer of creative IP that make these just games that are just blowing up in, in families. Kids are just going nuts for these toys and these games and these Spyro games and they want all this shit and Netflix is making a TV show based on Skylanders and all this crap. To be at the top of your game doing that shit and then to have this fall from grace where it's like, okay, the Toys from Life kind of moment is 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 gone now. Can you do some dog shit support work on Call of Duty now? Like, that's probably a little crushing when, when you're a team comprised of developers who are equipped to work on a specific kind of thing. That's probably where your passion's at. And now you're being forced to do bitch work for another soulless Modern Warfare 3 skin that you don't care about. And they were probably just like, yo, uh, you ask what we need. You ask what we want, where our hearts are at, what we want to do. We want to go make these fucking games. We want to go do this shit. We want to go take risks and build our own IP. And and if we work on other things, do this and that. And I think what Xbox saw was, here's a way that you get what you want. We get what we want. Everyone's happy, right? Because Microsoft bought Activision because they want King. They want Candy Crush. They want a way into the mobile space. They want Call of Duty because Call of Duty on Game Pass equals millions and millions of new subscribers. And they want Blizzard. They want fucking Diablo and uh, Overwatch and Warcraft and shit like that. They want that cash cow shit. That's what. That's why Microsoft and Activision or Microsoft and Xbox bought Activision was for that stuff. They didn't buy it because oh, Toys for Bob. We can get them to make a new Guitar Hero game. Like that's that's not why you buy Activision. So if you're looking at this, times are tough. You know, and the, things are getting a little hairy in the games industry. You're supposed to cut staffing. You're supposed to close studios, do layoffs, downsize, run a little bit of a tighter, leaner ship. A really great way to do that is to be like, hey, we don't have to shut you down, Toys for Bob. We don't have to lay you guys off. We don't have to do anything. We can just say, we're not paying for your building anymore. We're not employing you guys. We're not doing the healthcare shit. You guys are free to walk away. Get your name, get your IP, get your identity, and go be your own independent free agent. And that way we don't have to be the bad guys and shut you down or fire you, or a bunch a bunch of you guys. And it's a win-win, right? But now that you guys are free agents, you're probably looking for some work. And, you know, it's expensive to give you guys all, you know, health insurance plans and to pay for an office for you guys to all work in. But, you know, what we could do is give you 50 or give you like 80, $100 million and be like, make us a Spyro game. Make us a Crash Bandicoot game. Maybe they are making that Conquer game. Maybe they are making that Banjo-Kazooie game. I wouldn't be surprised if, if Phil and the guys at Xbox were like, here's money. Here's our back catalog of games that our fans want. Which one of these projects would you like to work on? Do you want to do another Spyro game? Do you want to do a Banjo-Kazooie game? What, what do you, where are you guys at? Because that's kind of in your wheelhouse. Do you want to do that? Or maybe they're saying, you guys have some new ideas from games. Pitch us something. Pitch us a brand new IP. Pitch us, pitch us a brand new idea. We own the IP. We're going to publish it on Xbox. It's going to be an Xbox game. But you guys are independent. You guys get to go do your thing. Or maybe, because Xbox has been good about this in the past, maybe they say, you keep the IP. But we publish the game. We'll fund the game. And it's a day one Game Pass second party exclusive for Xbox. And knowing Xbox, it will only be exclusive for a year, and then it will come to PlayStation and sell better there anyway. But at least that way, Game Pass gets fed, Xbox gets new content, and it looks good for them. It's like a win-win-win. And that is the way I am reading everything that went down here. Um, and I think this is all great news, because I think Toys for Bob taking on the risks of maybe this next game shuts us down, maybe this next game puts us back to the heyday of of Skylanders I don't know I think that's better because they have the passion the creativity the opportunity to do their own thing and there are so few free agents left in the game space as everyone consolidates and gets acquired and it's so it's so hairy these days where it's like man if we were owned by an entity like Microsoft 
they'd probably just fucking lay us off or cut our staff or do some shit like that. Uh, whereas, you know, if we're, if we're free agents, yeah, of course there's always the fear of like one game flops and we're out of business, but at least we can keep the ga- the team together and know that our successes and failures are contingent on what we do as a developer and not what some fucking suit wants to do to make margins a little tighter, you know? So I'm, I'm all for this. I think toys for Bob. Good for you guys. The only thing I had to say to you is congratulations on your newfound freedom. Um, I hope you guys feel inspired and invigorated and are able to go make great games because the thing about toys for Bob is even though they, they, they really haven't made any games that I would necessarily say are like really big games that I love games. I'm just so passionate about, but I feel like they are a developer that has that potential and has that energy where like if they made a new original IP, I feel like it would be something that really speaks to me. You know, as someone who grew up and still today is just obsessed with like cartoony character platform games, you know, and Sonic is my whole identity and all that shit. Like, I feel like this is a developer, which are few and far between these days that, that really understands these kinds of like all ages, family games, comic mischief, action platforming, running around doing, doing fun shit. And we need more of this. So if this is a way to help sustain their, what, what they want to do and help, you know, give Xbox a win here or there with some game pass content. I think this is just fucking great all around. The only thing is, you know, that's one less support slave studio for the call of duty machine. So what, what's the plan with that? I, again, I don't think this is happening. I don't think this is where we're headed. I would love to see a call of duty where we de-emphasize the number of people who need to be working on the franchise. And I know that would have to come at the expense of content. So yeah, maybe, I don't know, don't make fucking six seasons of, of, of fucking the boys and, and Nicki Minaj character skins and, and don't put all the fucking money and time and effort into war zone. And I don't know, a, a guy can dream, right? I don't know. So I, I think this is overall a pretty overwhelmingly exciting and positive story. I'm really happy for toys for Bob and also Xbox still fucking benefits. So if you're a console warrior and you only care about these guys in relation to what can they do to strengthen your favorite team, shut the fuck up. They're still making games for Xbox. So what do you care, man? So I don't know. I'm, I'm happy all around with it. Uh, next up, let's talk about Embracer Group a little bit. Some more feel good news. I guess we can talk about these two together. But a Bloomberg report says that uh, Embracer is reportedly looking to sell Saber Interactive for a deal worth up to $500 million. Citing sources familiar with the transaction, the studio is being sold to a group of private investors. The deal will result in Saber becoming a privately owned company with around 3,500 employees in total across the studios worldwide, including U.S., Russia, and Portugal. Saber will also reportedly continue to work on their Star Wars remake, Knights of the Old Republic, following the deal. Now, in addition to that, VGC reports that, or I'm sorry, Kotaku reports, and this is relayed by VGC, that Gearbox Software could be even closer than uh, to being sold off by parent company Embracer Group, according to new reports. So Kotaku says that uh, CEO of Gearbox, Randy Pitchford, held a town hall meeting with staff this week and told them that a decision had been made regarding the studio's future with more information to be shared later. According to this report, Pitchford has been telling the staff that uh, for months that Gearbox's three options were to stay with Embracer, get sold to another company, or buy themselves back and become independent. Uh, Kotaku claims that the decision has been made to sell Gearbox to another company and the deal is being finalized. I, I really wish this was going independent and not being sold to another company, but this is still exciting. Refusing to confirm or deny any reports, Pitchford told Kotaku, I'm delighted that we might end up, uh, that we might be up to an interesting enough, sorry, let me restart. <laughs> Quote, I'm delighted that we that what we might be up to is interesting enough to people that you want to make a story about us for your readers. He adds, I always, as always, we want to be thrilled. We will be thrilled to share whatever we have project uh, to announce or news to share as we work hard towards our mission to entertain the world. So the question here is, who the fuck could be buying Gearbox? You know, it's like, who are the players? I mean, EA could do it and then they could shut them down, which is what EA does. Uh, Square Enix has gotten out of Western developers. Uh, Embracer Group was the obvious candidate and they bought them and now they're selling them. And then I guess it could be Xbox, but like Xbox, do you want to, that's the thing is like, it could be Xbox or PlayStation, but it's like, I feel like it would go to Xbox most likely, but it's like, are you going to make another purchase this close to Activision? I know you're not done yet, but like, okay, I don't know. 
I feel like I feel like games like Borderlands would be good Game Pass fodder, but also like I don't know. And then PlayStation's like I feel like these guys, you know, despite having a good reputation and making good games, I feel like aren't at the the quality level of like a PlayStation studio. So that'd be a weird get for PlayStation. So I'm curious to see where these guys are headed. I was really rooting for the they buy themselves back and go independent again. But it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. But nonetheless, it's exciting. We got uh, Gearbox being freed from Embracer as well as Saber Interactive. Saber Interactive. Saber is a developer slash publisher I have a lot of appreciation for. They've done a lot of support work on games I love. And they've also made games I, I freaking love. So as a publisher, they have 3D Realms. They have 4A games. So you're talking about like Duke Nukem and and, uh, uh, and uh, Metro. They also have uh, their various suite of teams that they have um and also they have tripwire um and, and and all these various teams that that do good shit so like in recent years they've had world war z um they've had insurgency sandstorm they've had the metro games they've had that evil dead game that came out uh what was that two a year ago two years ago i think it was one year ago so i mean they they they've worked on great shit and i'm, I'm glad to see that they're gonna they're gonna be able to make it on their own also, I did not know this, that they were headquartered in Fort Lauderdale. I thought they were Russian. So what the fuck is that about? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't know they were American. I and, and they're also three hours from me. I thought for some fucking reason that Saber uh, was a Russian team. I, I know they have a Russian team, but I thought that was like the... Huh, I don't know why I didn't, I didn't know that. Anyway, so it's just it's just great to see Embracer and, uh, and Gearbox be able to live to see another day get out of the Embracer deal, hopefully mostly or completely unscathed. And yeah, that's just, again, it's like this This week is the opposite of what we've been dealing with the past few weeks. New game releases, teams getting independence, uh, people being able to fight to see another day. It's, it's good shit, man. Uh, Cronky writes in and says, I saw a PC gamer thing about Gearbox being acquired from Embracer. Any bets on who's buying them? Not many companies are big enough uh, to buy them, so the money... My money's on take two personally. If we already have the answer by next week, then boo. Um, that's a good guess. I didn't think about take two. I I feel like it it could be take two, right? Because they do a lot of live servicey stuff, and take two also has smaller um, publishing divisions like private division, uh, which they could use to publish Gearbox because sometimes they like to really just use take two for like 2K and Grand Theft Auto and things like higher profile things like that. So. Yeah, that that makes sense because didn't I mean Two K is who originally published Borderlands one and two, right? Yeah, Two K was the original publisher, so maybe they're going back home. That's not a terrible guess. My only thing about that is, I feel like Two K probably didn't want them in the first place, and that's why they never acquired them. But we're in this weird space now where I feel like we're still in this like people are hungry to consolidate in the games industry. But also, we're doing layoffs and downsizing, so I don't know if they're in a position where they want to acquire any talent, especially because they just announced that they're not laying anyone off, but they're looking to severely cut costs wherever possible. So I don't see how acquiring Gearbox would play into that. But you can hope and dream. I feel like Take-Two would be a great home for them if you know if the economic conditions were just right that they could make sense of it. But here's hoping, dude. So shout out to Toys for Bob. Shout out to uh, Saber Interactive and shout out to Gearbox. Hopefully they all have really healthy, good futures going forward and they're able to make awesome games uh, under no one's leadership or rule, although that's not that's not going to be the case because we know that uh, Gearbox just got bought by someone. So we'll probably, we'll probably find out in the next week. All right, let's wrap up the big news with some Game Pass updates for the month. So games available now and coming soon. We got some new games to talk about. So available now... Um, we already talked about this last time, but Warhammer 40k Bolt Gun is now on Game Pass. If you have not played this game, please give it a try. It is so fucking good. Uh, but coming soon, as the time this podcast goes live, Paw Patrol World will already be on Game Pass. And then on March 12th, we got SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. Um, played that a couple years ago. On March 13th, Control Ultimate Edition comes to Game Pass. That's good because I don't have that DLC, so I'll be able to go back and play that now. Um, on March 14th, no More Heroes 3 comes to Game Pass, and then on March 19th, we get both Lightyear Frontier, which is a game preview day one Game Pass game. Uh, game looks good, but I, I feel like it's got too much like base building crafting shit, so I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Maybe it's good. And then also MLB The Show 24. That's that PlayStation game that keeps coming to Game Pass day one every year. Uh, comes out on March 19th, so... 
Yep. And then leaving Game Pass, the following games will leave Game Pass on March 15th. So you got about you know, a week and a half to play them before they're gone. Hard Space, Shipbreaker, Nino Kuni, Wrath of the White Witch, Remastered, and Shredders all leave Game Pass on March 15th. So try them while you can. All right, guys. That's going to bring us to our last news segment, the important enough news. Stories important enough to make the podcast, but not important enough to warrant our own discussions. So we will rattle these off. In a relative, relatively quick succession, we got first our layoffs of the week. Yes, unfortunately, we're not entirely out of the clear with these, but thankfully, it's only one team. So on the bright side, we don't have like five teams to talk about layoffs for, if that helps, I guess. From VGC, see if these co-developer Radical Forge has laid off a handful of employees. The UK-based indie team posted on Twitter. I'm sorry, on X, about the restructure in order to continue operating the, in the current challenging market. They've also worked on Zombie Army 4 and uh, puzzle narrative game Bright Paw in 2020. Next up, Capcom have announced a new digital event that will take place across two broadcast days, um, beginning with one on the day this podcast goes live. Uh, titled Capcom Highlights, the first stream will be on March 7th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, with the second one being on March 11th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, each stream will be about 15 to 20 minutes long and will focus on things like uh, Kunitsugami, which we just saw at the Xbox Partner Direct, as well as the Dragon's Dogma 2 game coming out at the end of the month. The second stream is going to focus on Street Fighter 6, Exoprimal, Monster Hunter Stories, and Monster Hunter Now. It is important to note that the events will not talk about Monster Hunter Wilds, which we'll probably learn about this summer at some bigger event. Uh, next up, Respawn Entertainment is reportedly working on a new game in the Titanfall universe. Do not hold your fucking breath. That's according to Giant Bomb reporter Jeff Grubb, who is discussing Respawn's current project after it was confirmed that the parent company, EA, have canceled a Star Wars first-person shooter that they had been developing. Last year, Respawn vo boss Vince Zampella said that a very small team was working in the early stages of developing an original IP. The Skunk Works team had been led by Steve Fukuda, the game director of Titanfall 1 and 2, and he said that, quote, the mission is to find the fun in something new, they told Axios at the time. Seemingly referring to the same project as the last episode of Game Mess Mornings, Grubb suggested that it had entered a new prototyping phase. So this is really exciting, but I want to just say, pinch of salt, don't hold your breath. Not because Jeff Grubb isn't incredibly reliable, he is, but because... We knew there was a Titanfall game that got canceled. We know there was a Titanfall project within Apex Legends that got Titan that got canceled. And now there's a Star Wars first-person shooter that had Titanfall DNA in it that was canceled. So I don't want to talk about anything Respawn being definitive unless it's more Apex Legends content or another Star Wars Jedi game. Because apparently, even though Respawn Entertainment is an incredible developer, and the two games I just noted are not bad games by any stretch of the imagination, it just seems like us Titanfall fans will never get what we fucking want. And so it is better to keep your expectations and hopes as low as fucking possible, so that nothing will be crushed and you will still believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. All right, next up, Suicide Squad Killed the Justice League's first season of post-content will include which includes the Joker, will launch on March 28th. So that's season one. I am definitely getting in on that, and it is free content. Next up, Sony Interactive Entertainment has announced a PC version of Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut. In, developer, in, develop, uh, in development by Nixes, in collaboration with the original creator Sucker Punch Productions, the game's coming on May 16th via Steam and Epic Game Stores. Originally released for PlayStation 4 back in July of 2020, the open-world adventure game is set during the Mongol invasion of Japan in 1274. I have wanted to play this game for a very long time, so I'm very excited that it's coming to PC. I don't know that I'll play it at launch, but this is very much a game that is going directly into my backlog. Um, one of those PlayStation games that I, you know, by the time this game came out in 2020, I pretty much had the PS4 like packed up in, in, in storage. Like, like this game came out a month or two after the last of us part two and the last of us part two was very much like for me, it was like, this is the last PS4 game I play before the new Xbox and PlayStation come out. And basically after this game, I'm ready to pack this thing up and call it a generation. So I didn't play Ghost of Tsushima and I know I need to, I know it's a good game and I really need to get to it. So I'm very excited that I'll be able to play it on PC soon. Uh, and next up, and finally, Rockstar Games have reportedly requested that employees return to office full-time as they approach the final stages of GTA 6 development. According to Bloomberg, Rockstar head of publishing Jen Colby told staff the company plans to end hybrid working for productivity and security reasons, saying that they believe that there are tangible benefits to in-person work. We don't have to get into that, but yeah. All right, and that's going to do it for all of our news this week. You guys, we made it to the end of the podcast. The comments, 
The shout outs from YouTube.com. It's the best part of the whole deal. You know how it works. You head on over to YouTube.com, click on the latest episode of the Xbox on podcast and leave any kind of comment you want. Something nice, something mean, something in between. You can say anything your heart desires and I will read it on the goddamn podcast because I'm desperate for interaction with you, the audience. How does that sound for professionalism? We have five entries to go into because we already read a bunch of comments throughout the show. So starting off, Kronky says the following, and I say to this, so true. Quote, either the games industry has changed or become more grim, or I'm just an old jaded, or I'm just old and jaded, or both. Bring back 2007. So, so true. All right, next up, Tim R. writes in, and he's got two conundrums or two 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 conversations I want to open up. I'm excited to talk about both of these. So let's start with this first part where he says, at this point, should I just trade in my Xbox One and get an Xbox Series X, or should I just hold on to it long enough to leapfrog to the next generation? Tim R., are you still playing on an Xbox One, or are you playing on a PC? Because there's a lot of ways, you know, if you just moved over to PC and your Xbox is like your secondary thing, there's a lot of ways we could take this. Because let's assume you have a PC or a PS5 or something and the Xbox One is like your supplemental box. I would just say, it's kind of hard. If Xbox is like your supplemental box, I would just say, get yourself a freaking Series S on the cheap and upgrade to that and hold on to that for a while. Because... If you just need an Xbox as like a secondary place to play, the Xbox Series S it will more than enough take care of you, and I think it will get you going for a, a decent amount of time. It's fast, it's snappy, it does all the things you need it to do, and it's a great little package. Now, if you are a primary, pr- primarily Xbox gamer, and you're like, I just haven't pulled the trigger on one of the new consoles yet, that's that's different, man, because that's it's kind of crazy to say. Because at that point, I would say. You've made it this far into the generation without buying a Series S or X. I don't know. My cheap ass would be like, maybe there's like some game to win here in trying to hold off. Because as the rumor suggests, the next generation of Xbox, while this isn't the guarantee, is supposed to come in 2026. That's in two years. This year we'll get like a a different model, like a slimmer digital model of the Series X if if everything's to be believed. Uh, But... You know, in two years, in 2026, we're supposed to get the next generation of Xbox. So I would say if you've just been playing on Xbox One and you're happy with the experience and you don't mind like streaming Xbox Series games to your Xbox One via cloud gaming, then just rough it up for another fucking two years. And there you go. I mean, some of the biggest stuff of this generation has already happened with games like Starfield and whatnot. So if you're fine just streaming stuff or you have a PC or PS5 to play some other games on, I'd say rough it up, give it, give it two more years and then just save up your money and then be ready to be there day one for the next Xbox, I, I guess. But then again, if you didn't buy a Series S or a Series X early on in this generation, I don't see why you should buy the next generation day one. It doesn't seem like you need to be a day one supporter if it's not that pertinent that you own a next gen console. So I don't know. I feel like I need more information. Tim R, feel free to write in and let me know, you know, if you, if you want a little more context. Are you primarily playing on PlayStation? Are you primarily playing on PC? Are you just trying to be frugal with money and you're going, hey, my Xbox One works just fine. Why why upgrade? Let me know a little bit more about it. And then maybe we can give you a little more advice. Audience, feel free to chime in if you want to uh, give unsolicited advice to Tim R. But I don't know, man. I, I will say this. Aside from just being an Xbox nerd and having the pressure of having a podcast needing to, you know, kind of pressuring me to keep up with things and be like, oh, I need to be there day one to get the new Xbox. I will say... I wasn't fully convinced that I needed a new console when Series X was coming out. I was totally happy with my Xbox One and felt like that generation could have lasted another two, three years and I would have been fine. I was happy with the experience I was having. But the second I came home and that Xbox Series X was delivered by Amazon, I plugged that bitch up and I booted up Destiny 2 on it just to see what 4K gaming looked like and all that. Immediately, I was like, oh yeah, there's no going back. Just because it was the console was so fast and snappy the game looked so much the same game I've been playing on my Xbox One looked so much better on the Series X. It was immediately one of those like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I, I, it's worth it. You know, as someone who spends as much time as I spend playing video games, predominantly on Xbox, mind you, even if it is just quality of life and just you know higher, you know, it looks a little prettier and it runs a little faster and all that. That quality of life upgrade was worth it to me. And keep in mind, I I was not an Xbox One X purchaser. I had a day one Xbox One, and I held on to that bitch until the very end of it all. So, 
that I, I I tend to try and be frugal, you know. I, I I don't usually buy like the pro model or ooh, this model has a picture of Master Chief's butt cheeks on it, so you should buy this version of it. It's like I don't I don't need all that. But upgrading to the Series X, it just felt like a big quality of life improvement, but one I did not regret embarking on. So that's all I'll say. Now you have a totally unrelated question, and I want to talk about this. I, I titled this. I gave this a very college essay title, um, where I'm calling your comment. Growing length of video games, problem or privilege? So here's your comment. You said, I've started to notice a growing number of people complaining about the length of games, especially RPG games uh, that that boast hundreds of hours of content. I assume it's because the opinion is nearly universally coming from podcasters and content creators who not only have an incentive to play a larger number of games for content, but are also enthralled by the culture of gaming. So it's in their nature to want to experience as much as possible. I enjoy games longer than just a few hours. However, there are also se- there also seems to be a trend to chase long play times by making games repetitive and adding mechanics that slow progression down. As is the case with most things in life, the right ans- the right amount is somewhere in the middle. Sorry for the long comment, but not sorry enough to make it shorter, evidently. Uh, I love that. Thank you for writing it. Uh, this is a great comment, very thoughtful, and don't apologize for the length. I think you, you, it took, it you know, Took the number of words it took to say the thing you need to say. Don't feel bad about it. You're good. Um, the thing is, you you do kind of address the problem and give the answer that I, I also agree is, is pretty much where we are, where the answer is somewhere in the middle. Because we absolutely do have a culture where I think YouTubers and podcasters, people even like myself, not to say like I'm some big podcaster, but to say I do complain about this on my podcast. Uh, yeah, that games are getting too fucking long. I, I bitch about this all the time. And yeah, while to some extent, yeah, a lot, as is the case with a lot of things in media and all types of media, it is a problem being brought on by a bunch of privileged and entitled people bitching and moaning about something that is a slight inconvenience to them. And then it suddenly feels like a bigger, broader problem because the people with the most say, the people with the biggest voice and the loudest voice have this, have deemed this certain thing to be an issue. So, yeah, to some extent, absolutely, yeah, man. YouTubers who have to get new reviews out all the time, play all the latest games to keep up with the content, keep up with the industry, um, it, it's becoming an, a cumbersome thing for them to keep up with all these 50, 70-hour video games coming out left and right. But I think also it is objectively true. I mean, it is just factually true that there are more games coming out now than ever before. There are also more quality games coming out than ever before because even though, you know, like in the say the Xbox 360 era or like even the OG Xbox era, there were plenty of video games coming out. The number of games that were at a quality level, I know we complain about games like, oh, it has a day one patch or the matchmaking's bugged or like, oh, it's got a glitch. It's a game breaking bug. And like we complain about this stuff. But when you judge games on the whole for like what they are and what they end up being in today's world, like you, you just get on average higher quality, better games. And yes, it's a pro- I'm not saying it's not a problem that a lot of games come out with issues that need to be patched and fixed. But I'm saying overall, like the, the, the total package, what the game actually is, games are, developers are experienced and they're knowledgeable and the, the industry has matured enough to a point where we understand the do's and the don'ts of game development enough to where most games that come out, even games that are deemed quote unquote bad, are underwhelming. For example, a game like Starfield comes out. A game like Starfield looks great, plays great, is compelling, has lots to offer. People write it off as dog shit. Oh, Starfield is shit. Starfield's a piece of crap. Starfield is a dated, boring, stupid game. What a what an absolute one out of ten piece of shit. Okay. It's okay to be hyperbolic, whatever, say what you want to say. But compared to some of the ac- actual like shovelware garbage we used to get on like the Wii and the PS2 and stuff like that. Starfield's not a 1 out of 10 piece of garbage. It's not a broken, fucking useless game with mechanics that don't work and AI that's frustrating and camera controls that are constantly working against you. Remember early 3D games, how every fucking game had god-awful camera controls? We don't have these issues in games anymore because game development has gotten to such a mature place that even the games that aren't great are still good or still competent. So... We just have so many good games coming out. That's a very long way of just saying there are so many good games coming out today. And then on top of that, that makes gaming so competitive. It's such a, it's a landscape where it's like everyone's vying for your attention. 
And one of the big ways, especially these big publishers, get the attention of people and get the dollars of the consumers by saying, well, hey, our game is a great value. It's got like 50 hours of content and then there's like tons of side content and then you can play it online and we'll give you seasonal content. We'll let you dress up as all your favorite characters from all the movies that don't make sense with this video game. We'll let you dress up as King Kong and the boys and Nicki Minaj all at the same fucking time and you can fight, I don't know, you can fight David Bowie. Why not? You know, like, and games are constantly trying to give you more content, bigger world, more to explore, more reasons to come back. New game plus updates, right? Seasonal battle passes and con- all the shit. And it's just ways to be like, yeah, we know you're looking at game X, but the reason why you should buy game Y is because we have a bigger world. We have more things to explore, more things to do. And that way, it's a way of saying, we know you can't tell which game is objectively better, but $70 is better spent on our game because it's got more content, because it's longer, because it's bigger. And bigger is not always better and longer is not always better. A lot of these games are pumped with full of fucking bloat. And we just talked about it. I just talked about it, right? Like, I'm playing a game like Wasteland 3, which is... I, I don't, We don't even need to get on a tangent about what an obvious labor of love that game is. That game is purely passion and love poured into a, a, a game that is very niche. Um, and there's so much to see and do in that game. But it's one of those games where you play it, and you can tell that everything that is put into that game is there because passionate and inspired people had a burning desire to get that into the game. But you play a game like Far Cry, and no offense, Far Cry, I love Far Cry. But you play a game of like Far Cry, a game made by like seven different Ubisoft teams across like four different continents over the course of two years with 1,200 developers working on it. And it's like the gunplay is good. The environment is stunning. You know, the story is usually pretty badass. The moment-to-moment gameplay feels really good. But... It's like a 17 hour open world game with like 70 hours of open world content to tick off the box. And about 50 to 60 hours of that content is kind of useless, boring filler garbage. And no offense to the people that like that filler content in games like Far Cry. You're allowed to like that. No problem with that. But like, oh, I my, my, I need you to come over here and find gasoline to pour into my tractor trailer so I can get these goddamn drugs off my cornfields. It's like those kinds of stupid fucking missions you get in, in, in a Far Cry game. It's like, yeah, that's that's nonsense. That's just that's just nonsense. That's just burning the fucking player's time so that Ubisoft can brag about their 70-hour Far Cry game so that hopefully you buy their $70 Far Cry game over fucking CD Projekt Red's 70-hour 70, 70 you know, Witcher game or whatever. It's, it's just all competition. So that stuff's got to be noted. It's absolutely, and everything has to be long. Suicide Squad killed the Justice League. I just talked about how I enjoyed that game a bunch. And I did. The game took me like 13, 14 hours to beat. And I was totally satisfied with it when I, when I beat the game. But why does this fucking game got to be like, don't forget there's post launch con there's post there's post game content you got to keep grinding and getting other loot from different vendors so you can get better weapons it's like i don't need harley quinn to fucking loot grind for better weapons i'm good i'm gonna come back in season one and play that new joker content because it's story content and i want to see if they have like good story content content that's of a similar quality to like the main game's content and if it's not i'll say fucking buy and delete that game off my hard drive and move on but you know, it's like, why did a game like Suicide Squad have to be that? So there's no denying that it's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Yeah, if you're a podcaster, if you're someone whose job it is to keep up with the industry and play the latest games and always have something to say about the new thing, yeah, I can see how it's frustrating. And you might complain and be like, man, I wish games were shorter. But I don't know. Maybe it's also as I grow older, I'm able to feel this more and more. But like, come on, man. Like, I don't, I have the demographics. I have I have the metrics of my podcast. I know that the the majority of the people that listen to this podcast are around like their 30s. Like YouTube shows me that data. So I, I feel like a lot of you listening can definitely relate when you say like, when I say, remember like 20 years ago when, when you're like, man, I really love this one game I have. I just wish it had more content because I love playing it over and over and over again. And I don't have money for another video game. And I got to wait till my birthday or Christmas to get another video game. And also when I come home from school, the only obligation I have is to eat my fucking green veggies and learn division. You know, it's like, you remember that time in your life? Yeah. It would have been nice for a game to been 200 hours long. 
But I don't know. The older I get, the more I'm like, I don't necessarily want to commit that much time to my life playing this game. And even before I did Xbox on, you know, like five years ago, I still very much had this sentiment as well. It's like, I have a lot of games I want to get to not because I want to be part of the conversation, but because like, man, I just, I want to be able to play all the games I want to play, like, or as much of them as possible. Like I don't, I just, I need games to be respectful of my time. You know, I just need a game to be like, Hey, it's okay to, to stick around for a weekend, play 12 hours and then on to the next thing. You know, like imagine if movies were that obnoxiously persistent. Imagine if, if movies were like, no, 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 don't, don't go, don't go. There's, there's more, there's seasonal content. I mean, unless you're like a Marvel movie or an American sitcom TV show or like a Japanese anime, fucking look at one piece. Uh, most of those things never fucking end, but most TV shows, like they end most movies, they end. I know sequels exist. I mean, it's not a best example, but you know, it's like, I don't know. Wouldn't it suck if a movie's like, oh, but it's don't, don't go see Barbie. See Oppenheimer, because Oppenheimer's three hours and Barbie's only an hour and a half long. So the movie talk, the, the movie talk, it, the movie ticket costs the same amount. So your money's better spent seeing Oppenheimer. It's like, no, that's stupid. Go see the fucking movie you want to see. Enjoy it. It is what it is. So I just, I don't know. My thing is like, I don't care. Maybe everyone has a different experience and a different answer to this question. That's fine. My whole thing is it always comes back to the same sentiment. I just want games to be the length they need to be to satisfy the vision and the story that the creators want to tell. Sometimes that means games are going to be 50, 60, 70 hours long. Sometimes that means a game might be six hours long. Sometimes a game might be fucking three hours long because that's all it takes to experience what it is the developers want to create and show to you. I don't care. I'm happy to pay $40 for this game, $70 for that game. I don't care. If the game is good enough, if the experience is worth my time and money, I'll pay. I don't give. I don't give a shit. I I I I feel so disconnected to like the complaining and belly aching people have about oh games are seventy dollars now. I get that like times are tough and like things are expensive. Like I I'm totally sympathetic to that. I'm also very much affected by these things. But I don't know. Like when I don't know. Like I I when when I buy a game when I buy a game like Suicide Squad, I'm like I don't know. Yeah, 13, 14 hours to beat the game. Like I felt like that was. $70 well spent, but now I'm playing Wasteland 3 and it's like a 40 hour game and I'm playing it through Game Pass. I'm like, man, I'm getting so much fucking value out of this one Game Pass thing. And I don't know when, when, uh, let's think about a game that's coming out this year that I'll probably buy because it won't come to Game Pass. When, uh, well, here we go. When Star Wars Battlefront collection comes out in a few weeks, I want to buy that. It's 40 bucks. Uh, I, I'll happily buy that. But, um, you know, I might only spend like, four hours playing the first Battlefront game and then like 10 hours playing the second Battlefront game. I don't know. I just want to take a stroll down memory lane and enjoy like a weekend or two of playing Battlefront again. Like, I don't, I don't care. It's $40 well spent. I don't like, it's not, it's not the end of the world. You know, sometimes you get more time out of something than uh, some other game, but I don't know. I just, I don't like measuring value in time. I like measuring the value and the quality of the experience. I don't know, whatever. I'm just I'm just kind of going on on on, but Timar, I appreciate. It. I think this is a great conversation, and I welcome other people's opinions and feedback on this. I know some people aren't going to agree with my my take. I know some people will agree, but I don't know. Like it's it's not like a really big deal. It's just I just want to make sure that like the content we're putting out, the art we're putting out, right, is uh, as much. I understand there are financial implications to everything. So every movie, every novel, every every video game are all works of art. But they are also commodities and they are also products and, and, and outcomes of the, the world we live in, the economic factors that control the world and the way it moves, right? And so there are going to be decisions that impact the movies we watch and the games we play that are financially driven and are driven by trends and are driven by, you know, desires to target specific people and try to guarantee as much success as possible for the product you're making but my hope is that a work of art whether it be a video game movie whatever can try to despite all the economic factors that have to influence the art itself can try to be as much a realization as its creative vision as humanly possible with as little encumbrance from the economic realities that that impact that product does that does that make sense i know i'm being kind of vague and wordy with the way i'm saying that but i hope that makes sense like 
let, let people make the thing they want to make. And then hopefully the quality and the value will shine on its own and people can see that. And then, you know, the good stuff will rise to the top. I don't know. Here's a little teehee comment. HD Hobbs writes in and says, you laugh, but I reworked my whole schedule last year just to squeeze a couple extra days to take my family to piss on the Eiffel Tower. Being an adult is hard. I don't know if that was in the comments last week or if that's a new one, but goddamn, I love that comment so much. If you know, you know. And then our final comment this week comes from first time user, first time commenter. I don't know. I don't know. Is this usually your username? It's it's user dash XL nine X Y eight F K three C S rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? But uh, wrote in and said, uh, we got a lengthy comment here, but this is our this is our final comment of the week. So let's let's dig right in. I haven't read this yet, so I I don't I don't know what we're going to talk about. You said uh thing we started with bedroom coders in the 1980s. They were making games for the love of it. They grew into professional developers and made bigger teams in the 1990s. Suddenly games were being made by 10 to 20 people. This is why this is when they enjoyed a major success and the teams grew again to 50 people. Uh, then the PS2 era and then and then suddenly by the PS3 era they were at 100 people. Suddenly, by the PlayStation 4, we had international teams of 1,000-plus people making AAA games, as so many assets needed to be created due to, due to new fidelity. However, to be created due to new fidelity... Sorry, however, under, under it all, you had the original people in charge, the creatives that cut their teeth in the 80s and the 90s working with small teams. However, in the last decade, they all seemed to get fed up and start leaving the studios they created, and it really picked up steam in the second half. Suddenly, now we have these huge... Uh, captainless studios that are just game factories without any creativity because the talent that built them has gone. You just have hundreds of people that are just there to get their paycheck and so it is no surprise they keep making bad games. So seeing these old creatives leave and make smaller teams and then keep saying, I want to work I never want to work for a team above 30 people, I think we're just going to go back to the 90s and early 2000s era of development where dynamic small teams are driving the ship and AA games make a comeback for big publishers. They can place their bets on 20 AA games rather than one AAA game. This is all possible now thanks to the engines like Unreal delivering AAA graphics with minimal effort for things like and things like AI, which can quickly do the work of 10 times the people. With physical games going away and digital being dominant, developers do not need publishers either. The old developers and the cash... Uh, the old developers with the cash can do the funding and take the risk for their own new studios. However, eventually they will all retire and then big publishers, if there are any left, will buy them up and start their own triple A cycle again. So user XL nine, etc. There are, there's some inference to what you're saying that I kind of disagree with here or there. And I'll, I'll try to avoid going to those avenues, not to disagree with you, but because I want to keep it to your broader point which I appreciate your kind of historical context behind it because I think I don't I, at least I feel pretty similarly about what you're saying here, um, and I feel like this is a, a you know kind of to last week's co- uh, conversation the gaming the games industry needs to change. Um, I th- I think this sums up kind of what's happened and where we've come quite well, and you see the stories almost weekly, where it's like so and so you know, long story developer behind Grand Theft Auto or various Bioware games or whatever has left this team and has now formed a new team called Bedroom Coder Games Inc. And is getting money from communist China to make a a brand new game. And you see that story like constantly where it's all these teams and like big people are leaving and they're going to start new teams and et cetera, et cetera. And to a large extent, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. And I, I think it's a similar story. Um, and I really, really do hope this is where we're headed because because this is the problem. Games are way too expensive to make and they require too many people and they're just too resource intensive. And I will say this, this is kind of one way in which I'm diametrically opposed to Xbox's hardware initiative, which is that it's nice that Xbox is like, oh, the most powerful gaming platform. I don't give a shit about the most powerful gaming platform. I've pretty much been satisfied with the way games look and feel since like the Xbox 360 years. And that's not to say I don't want my games to look and run prettier and better. Um, It's nice when a game looks and runs great, but I am more or less pretty damn satisfied with, with games where they look and play. And when I think about like where most modern AA games are in terms of like graphical fidelity and stuff and art and assets and all that stuff, and I'm pretty, pretty happy with games like Atlas Fallen and Evil West and stuff like that. And that kind of look where it's like, 
an early Xbox One style game. Like, it, they look great. And I think that is, like, the number one place we need to go to when we have this conversation of, like, what do we need to do to cut back on the cost of game development? Games don't need to look hyper-realistic. And if you can't handle a game that ha- that is a realistic art style, but the graphics aren't so goddamn good that you think you're watching a movie, then we need to embrace art style more in games. Things like Sea of Thieves and stuff where it has like its own unique art style and it doesn't need to have the most groundbreaking graphics because the art style does so much of the heavy lifting. You know, you don't need as much graphical fidelity when you have like smoothed over, less detail intense faces with cartoonish self shaded you know, kind of like flair and stuff like that. So I'm all for those kinds of directions. And I am all for, again, this kind of talk goes into the conversation we just had, looking at a game and saying, what is the game we're trying to build? And as much as humanly possible, let's just try to make the game that is in service of that vision. Instead of being like, well, in order to compete with this game, we're going to have to have a bigger open world. In order to compete with this game, we're going to have to have this kind of combat mechanic. We're going to we're gonna really have to focus on parrying and dodge rolls. We're really going to have to have a new game plus mode to really entice people to play our game a second time. Like, the more we can get away from games having a weird need to do that and be that thing, I'm not saying that games inherently should never have that stuff, but the more we can get away from, like, the obligation for games to be that, and the more we can just be like, hey, I have a really fun idea for a game where you roll around on roller skates and you have guns. It's called a roller dome. Like, that's that's the kind of shit that's going to get us. And I, I, I see this conversation popping up a lot very recently as a response to like all these layoffs and everything going on in the industry where it's like, yeah, the double A and the indie are about to fucking eat the triple A games lunch. And you know what? I'm fucking here for it. Let's, let's, let's go, baby. I I've long said on this podcast that double A is basically the heart and soul of the games industry to me. Like the imperfect games where it's like, we have enough money and enough staff to try new ideas and really try to go out there and be crazy and make cool games. But we don't have, the budget to in in the rope to fucking hang ourselves with like triple a games. So it's like, you got more money than a indie game where you can kind of envision something a little more, a little bigger, a little more grand, but not so much so that you end up making one game for 12 fucking years. And then, you know, end up going under because you, you spent three years trying to make one of the characters fucking eyebrows look as realistic as human humanly possible. So, I'm I'm all for this shit. I I bring it on, dude. Have all the old old timers go back and make smaller teams. Uh, let's let's keep letting these AAA games fucking crash and bomb. Although I don't wish for teams to fail. Um, just you know, keep voting with your wallet and speaking to the games that are speaking to you. And we see a lot of this conversation very recently, where it's like, hey, there's a lot of indie games and a lot of AA games coming out lately that are really taken off. And there's a lot of triple a games and big games that are really letting people down and, and kind of bombing. And hopefully this is the market saying like, Hey, we want games that are like pure and authentic and just fun and creative. Not necessarily games are like bigger, better, more spend more hours. So I, I feel like this comment actually plays in a lot to Tim R's previous comment. And I appreciate you kind of giving the timeline to add the context around the conversation, but yeah, man, I, I love seeing this more power in the hands of the developers, more hands in the power of the small teams and less of a reliance on the distribution channels and the marketing and the AAA budgets and the publishers and, you know, having to inject your games with bloat and features just for the sake of marketability. So I'm fucking here for it. This sounds like, you know, it could be a monkey's paw situation, could be a careful what you wish for type of deal, but I, if this is the direction we're headed in, I'm more excited about gaming than ever before. So that's great. <laughs> I appreciate your writing. That's actually going to do it for the podcast this week. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up, get this thing edited and ready for tomorrow. And uh, yeah, thank you all so much for listening. If you haven't already, please consider leaving a five-star review on the podcast on whatever podcast service you leave. Leave a YouTube uh, comment or thumb it up or subscribe or something. And then to help the show grow a little bit, we've been incredibly stagnant. And I'm always pretty open and honest about um, these kinds of things, because I'm, mean, what incentive do I have to lie to you? So I would just honestly like to grow the show if possible, and I could, you know, the show could benefit. I could benefit a lot um, from your feedback. Um, remember, as always, I kind of facetiously say, only leave five star reviews. If you have anything mean to say, keep it to yourself. 
Or, you know, DM me. Tell me, Jesse, you fucking suck and I hate your podcast. You can DM that to me. But don't leave a two-star review on iTunes because that's going to hurt the show. I'm glad you understand. I'm glad we're on the same page. Anyway, silliness aside, pleading aside, thank you all so much for being here and listening. If you made it through the very end, you know I love you. Have a great week. Be well. Feel free to try that new empanada thing at Taco Bell. It's it's just fine. Uh, Wasteland 3 fucking rules. And until next week, power your dreams. Thank you.